Now it is 9.01, so we should start now our webinar for today. Good day everyone. Kamusta po tayong lahat? We hope that all of you are safe and healthy during this time. We warmly welcome you all to this webinar organized by the Community Innovation Study Center of the College of Public Affairs and Development, or CISC PAC. For our participants' information, this is one of the many research outputs from the CISC PAC researchers. CISC is one of the research arms of CIPAF alongside the Center for Strategic Planning and Policy Studies or CSPPS. Today, we will be sharing to you some of our researchers' productive project engagements through this webinar titled Adaptation and Cooking Strategies of Coastal and Lake Fishing Communities Amidst Climate Change. We warmly welcome all our distinguished participants, not only in Zoom, but also on Facebook. We are streaming live through the UPLB CIPAF Facebook page. For more updates and knowledge sharing webinars like this, please visit the official website of CIPAF UPLB and also like and follow us on our social media platforms. My name is David Rodriguez, a University Research Associate of CIS CIPAF and I will be your moderator this morning. Now, before we begin, let us, run, let us run through some of the house rules of the webinar. First, for participants who have questions, kindly type these in the Q&A tab of Zoom. For any clarifications, comments, or insights, kindly type in those via the chat box of Zoom. For Facebook participants, please maximize the use of Facebook comment section during our live webinar. Questions, clarifications, or insights will also be entertained during the open forum section later. Lastly, e-certificate of attendance will be provided through emails after answering the feedback evaluation form that will be flashed at the end of this webinar. To remind everyone of our program this morning, here is the outline of our webinar today. We'll be having two research speakers and two discussions respectively. After that, we will be proceeding directly to the open forum and we will have the overall synthesis in the end. Currently, we have about 50 participants in Zoom and 14 Facebook viewers. Again, to our distinguished attendees who have tuned in, good morning. We highly appreciate all your presence. So, to officially start our program, let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord through an invocation followed by the Philippine National Anthem. Dear God, we glorify you for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We are truly grateful for them. Thank you for allowing us today to meet and share our knowledge and time with one another virtually. May you send forth your divine wisdom to our speakers as they impart effectively their God-given gift to all of us. May they be blessed as they continue to share their expertise to the people who need them. Bless the participants as well so that they would be able to obtain vital information from this activity. May you send forth your Holy Spirit so that after this webinar, we may share what we learn in the spirit of your love and generosity especially during these trying times. May we be able to bring glory to your word in everything that we do. Amen. Thank you. 
to grace our webinar this morning, may I kindly call on Dr. Rowena D. Tibacongis, the Dean of the College of Public Affairs and Development, to deliver the opening remarks. Salamat, David. Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Sana po ay nasa mabuti tayong kalagayan. Alam ko po na abala ang karamihan sa atin sa iba't ibang bagay. At kami po ng mga kasamahan ko sa SIPAP ay natutuwa na inyong pinahahalagahan ang ating webinar ngayong umaga. Sa ating mga tagapagsalita, si Dr. Miriam Nguyen at si Ms. Samantha De Los Santos. Ang ating mga discussant, Ms. Nazarene Castro, Dr. Jennifer, Marie S. Amparor, maraming salamat sa pagbibigay ninyo ng pagpapahalaga sa webinar ngayon. Ang ating director, si Director Blanquita Pantoja, ang director ng Community Innovation Center o CISC, mga kasamahan ko sa kolehiyo, mga panauhin, magandang umaga po. Ako'y nagagalak na tayo ay nagtitipon-tipon para sa isang napakahalagang pagbabahagi na ginawang pananaliksik ng ating mga kasamahan sa kolehiyo. Ang mga kasamahan nating mangingisda ay nabibilang sa sektor na vulnerable dahil sa maraming bagay. First, is that their choice of income relies on good weather conditions. And secondly, the supply chain from the fishing areas to the market requires a lot of improvement to directly benefit the fishermen. Marahil ay marami pa pong rason at ito ay malamang natatalakayin ng ating mga tatapagsalita ngayong umaga. Katulad na po ng nabanggit ko, ang mga fisherman ay vulnerable at uh, kailangang mayroon iba't ibang strategiya upang mapabuti pa lalo ang kanilang kalagayan. Ang CISC ay hindi lamang tumitigil sa pananaliksik bagkos ay mayroon din silang mga inisyatiba na kung saan ay tumutulong silang magkaroon ng mga process products ang ating mga fishermen. Sa katunayan, bago magka-pandemya, ay regular na may mga ibinibentang produkto sa kolehiyo galing sa mga kooperatiba na partners ng CISC SIPAF. Ngayong umaga po, layunin ng ating mga tagapagsalita na hindi lamang natin mapakinggan ang mga karanasan ng mga kasama nating mangingisda kundi maunawaan ang kanilang adaptation and coping strategies. At sana po ay hindi lamang doon um, mag-i-end ang ating uh, activities ngayong umagang ito bagkos ay magkaroon din tayo ng ating mga inisyatiba na makipagtulungan or makapag-collaborate tayo sa mga fishermen upang mapalakas ang kabuhayan ng mga mangingisda. Muli po, malugod na pagbati at magandang umaga. David? Yes, thank you very much, Dean Bakongis, for gracing and supporting this webinar. Indeed, this knowledge sharing webinar is very important for vulnerable fisher folks and communities. Also highlighting the productive research engagements of our very own researchers here in the college. Again, thank you, Dean Weng. So at this juncture, I am pleased to introduce our speaker. Our first research speaker this morning is Ms. Maria Francesca Otan. She is a university researcher at the Community Innovation Study Center, CIPAP, UPLP. She obtained her Bachelor of Science in Forestry and Master of Science in Community Development degrees in UPLP. She's also currently taking her PhD in Community Development as well. Ms. Stan, for the past 19 years, has been involved in various research projects with different research institutes in the Philippines and Japan. A number of her researches are mostly interdisciplinary in nature, which dealt with environmental and community studies. Please welcome Ms. Maria Francesca Otan. 
everyone. I'll be presenting on the adaptive coping mechanisms of lakeshore communities on climate-related disturbances in the major lakes of Luzon. So this will be the order of my presentation. I'll present a brief background of our research, profile of the fishing communities within the five major lakes, their knowledge or awareness on climate change, and uh, the occurrences of climate-related disturbances, which this fishing communities experience and its impacts, as well as the gender roles related to the adaptive coping strategies and the roles of institutions in helping the fishing communities. So for the project background, the main research project is developing strategies towards more resilient fishing communities amidst climate change, the case of major lakes of Luzon, which was funded by the Bureau of Agricultural Research. So it was implemented from January 2017 to October 2019. We came up with this project since um, we all know that uh, lakes have significant impacts on the surrounding communities. And in the last 30 years, the increasing frequencies and intensities of typhoons and other hydro hazards threaten the country's agricultural sector. So impacts of which are measured on the scale of damage, and quantified based on losses and damages. However, there are very limited studies that have been conducted to determine the extent of impacts on the vulnerable communities around the lakes. In addition, understanding the strategies of the communities to circumvent, prepare, or adapt to the changes brought about by climate change have not been thoroughly analyzed. So there are three studies under the project. Study one is the characterization and profiling of fishing communities. Study two is the community-based adaptation strategies on the effects of climate change. And study three, capacitating uh, fishing communities on climate change towards uh, improved resiliency. So the information that I'll be presenting are the results of study two. So this study in uh, particular aimed to characterize and profile fishing communities in the five major lakes, determine the roles of men and women, including government and private institutions in the enhancement of resilience of these communities in facing the negative effects of climate-related disturbances. So for the study sites, the five major lakes that uh, were visited are uh, Laguna Lake, which is the largest inland body of water in the Philippines, Nauhan Lake, the fifth largest lake in the Philippines, Taal Lake, the third largest lake in the country after Laguna Lake and uh, Lake Lanao, Lake Bato, the seventh largest lake in the Philippines, and Lake Buhi. Although Lake Buhi is not among the top 10 major lakes in the Philippines, uh, however, it is an important body of water being home of the famous Sinarapan or locally known as Tabios and numerous bird species from its surrounding forest. Thus, it was also included in the study. So the fishing communities who are living in the lakeshore areas in the five major lakes in Luzon are the focus of the study. So prof for the profile of fishing communities, the main source of income for all uh, the major lakes is open water fishing. Others are engaged in fish cage operation, fish trading, and processing. And to augment their household expenses during lean months of fishing, fisher folks look for alternative sources of livelihood. So a, mo a small percentage of fishermen are also farmers while others work as construction workers, tricycle drivers, or some are into livestock grazing, charcoal making, and fish vending. So their major uh, expenditures across all lakes are for the needs of the family. For example, uh, on food, education, utilities, and fishing gears come in as list in their priorities. There are also others who also allot a part of their income to savings and recreation. Uh, in terms of fishing communities' knowledge on or awareness on climate change, majority or more than 50% across the five lakes are aware of what climate change is. Their understanding of climate change is about changes in weather pattern or pabago-bago ng panahon or brought about by the unpredictable weather conditions, hence could not determine rainy and dry season. 
change in weather due to human activities such as illegal logging, cutting of trees, burning of waste, kainin system, use of chemicals for crop production, increased usage of uh, fuel like gasoline, diesel for vehicles, and others view it based on the effects of climate change such as frequent and strong typhoon, landslide, high temperature, drier dry season, and wetter wet season, and it causes fish kill and human sickness due to hot weather conditions. So uh, for the occurrences of climate-related disturbances, so among the climate-related disturbances that occurred in the last decades, typhoons and occurrence of the southwest monsoon or otherwise known as uh, habagat significantly affected the fishing communities across the five major lakes. In addition to typhoons, volcanic activities and earthquakes are the other extreme events that happened to the fishing communities, particularly in Taal, Taal and Bato Lake. Fishing communities also pointed out that the occurrence of these extreme events or climate-related disturbances usually happen once or twice annually. In terms of impacts of the climate disturbances uh, mentioned, flooding is the most common among communities in the five major lakes. So another common impact is the serious damages in transportation networks and infrastructure, which includes houses, electric posts, and water lines. It can also be noted that in Taal Lake, one impact to the community is the narrowing of um, lakeshore area. So fisher folks attributed this to the accumulation of solids such as soils and rocks during extreme events. In terms of impacts to the family, in Laguna Lake, families were unable to have sufficient monetary resources that led to the inability to provide for their members. So some families experienced hunger and diseases brought about by the occurrences of these water-related uh, catastrophes. For Taal Lake, more than the destruction of houses and properties due to flooding, some members of the community suffered emo emotional distraught and fear due to the occurrences of these events. Since income sources were uh, greatly affected, families also experienced hunger during calamities and made them fearful of typhoons. In Nauhan Lake, due to the impediments in livelihood, members of the family also experienced hunger and uh, discontinued sending their children to school due to tight budget. But what positive impact is why spending of available resources was employed by families since livelihood sources were uh, disrupted. So some also experienced trauma and illnesses because of the occurrences of these typhoons. For Bato Lake, health risks were also brought by the occurrences of typhoons in terms of um, skin diseases and fear incited with the members of the community. And lastly, for Lake Buhi, under repeated bombardment of um, typhoons, some members of the community had struggling living conditions. So families were separated to provide for the needs of their members by opting to work abroad, while others also left to work in Manila to have additional sources of income. So in terms of impacts to livelihood across the major lakes, Fishing activities were delayed because of damaged fishing equipments and gears, while those engaged in aquaculture experienced losses due to damaged fish cages. On the other hand, some open water fisher folks reap benefits from climate related disturbances, particularly typhoons, as catch increase that resulted from damaged fish cages. So, due to extensive damages to fishing gears and cages, which resulted to cessation of livelihood options, some fisher folks were, fo were forced to uh, loan money to augment financial constraints. Across the five major lakes, roles of males and female, uh, roles of males in the community encompass the general safety of their families and sources of livelihood. So these roles include reinforcements of houses, particularly roofing, uh, safekeeping of fishing equipments and gears, reinforcement of fish cages, and ensuring livestock are safe during extreme events. So while females 
roles include survivability of their family members during weather disturbances and evacuation. So preparation. So this includes um, preparation of ample food, medicine, clean clothing, and other essential items in evacu evacuation kits. Uh, is the major role taken by female members of the fishing families. In, ad in addition, particularly in Bato Lake, uh, male members help others, other fishers in putting their um, fishing gears and implements to higher grounds through Bayanihan. They also facilitate um, communication and inform co-fishers to stay alert and prepared during um, extreme events. So in general, the adaptive coping mechanisms of communities around the major lakes revolved in the maintenance and recovery of livelihood sources that were destroyed by the climate-related disturbances. So in Laguna Lake, uh, males in the family safeguard their houses after the occurrence of uh, these weather events. So this also involves quick repairs of houses to ensure livable conditions they also go back immediately to fishing or look for alternative uh, sources of uh, livelihood when conditions for the former are still unfavorable. So females of the family ensure that um, the houses and surroundings are clean. They also stay in the evacuation center with the rest of the family to ensure overall safety of members. They also assist the males in um, making sure that resources are enough for the family subsistence. So for Taal Lake, uh, in terms of coping mechanisms, males generally take care of repairs, may stay at home uh, in the house for, to safeguard property, and then some immediately go back to fishing when conditions are more favorable. Females, on the other hand, devote their time for generally taking care of the family during and after extreme events. They also concern themselves in cleaning the house after occurrences of extreme events. Um, in Nauhan Lake, male members in fishing communities regard uh, proactivity as a major coping mechanism. So during typhoons and extreme events, male members of community facilitate evacuation of their families as uh, the need arises. They also make sure that there is food relief distribution after extreme events, uh, male members look for alternative sources of livelihood. Some seek for financial assistance from relatives or uh, microfinance institutions. In addition, utilization of incomes and money uh, garnered um, after extreme events are for usually allotted for repairs of households. So they also had clean up. Uh, they also had clean up operations uh, within the community. And uh, on the other hand, uh, female members of the community cope adapt from extreme events through management of the household and family members. As typhoons greatly impede income sources, female members of the family also seek for loans to augment livelihood and needs of the household. So they also loan uh, come from they also loan from microfinancing agencies on and some also from relatives. They, all, they also ensure that there is a cleanliness of the house and wait for distribution of food relief in the community. For Bato Lake, uh, male members of the family immediately come back to fishing to catch the fish that escaped from the fish cages. So in addition, adaptive strategies also include borrowing of money and saving up for business investment by doing their own repairs and engaging in buy and sell. Mechanisms of females uh, include management of the household and family after extreme events. This also include um, staying with the family members and meeting their welfare. So they also seek assistance for microfinancing, uh, for microfinancing agencies to augment uh, meager incomes caused by the extreme events. So in Lake Buhi, maintaining sufficient livelihood source for the family is one way uh, male members of the community adapt from extreme events. So these strategies include fishing for one month using other gears such as patanga, bubo, and pukot. Participants were also suggestive that working harder after extreme events is another way of keeping um, their families fed. Others were uh, suggestive that members tend to leave the community and work in Manila. So female members of the family adapt to extreme 
events by managing the household and ensuring the welfare of the family. In some cases, females engage in forms of livelihood to ensure that security of the family is met. Other cases involve females uh, of uh, implanting edible crops in areas proximal to the houses to meet uh, other food requirements. So amidst the effects of climate-related disturb disturbances surrounding lakeshore communities, there are also institutions, both from national and local, private and non-government uh, organizations, which provide assistance and support especially during extreme events or climate-related disturbances. National agencies like the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, Department of Interior and Lo Local Government uh, are among the institutions which continuously provide help to lakeshore communities. With the responsibility for fisheries sector before, is active in providing fishing equipments and motorized bankas, including fishing gears to some beneficiaries in fishing communities. How, uh, however, um, only a handful is fortunate to receive um, assistance due to limited budget vis-a-vis -vis number of uh, fishermen. So before also distributed fingerlings and at times conduct lake seeding. So local initiatives mostly come from the city or municipal government. So this is also true with the barangay government, which is in the forefront during um, occurrences of extreme events. So even the provincial government, specifically the Office of the Provincial Agriculture, also provide assistance to lakeshore communities. There are also associations of fisher folks uh, that are actively engaged in directly providing assistance to its members. So fisher folks are organized in almost all of the study sites, aside from Barangay Fishery and Aquatic Resources Council or BFARMC and the organized Bantay Lawa, there are also fisher folks associations and fish pen or fish cage operators associations in the study sites. So since most of since most or if not all of these associations are not without funds, are without funds, so their major role is to make resolution to request fishing gears and supplies for endorsement of the, uh, their respective LGUs to various agencies or institutions. Unfortunately, it takes too long for their requests to be granted, so most of the time these requests remain to be requested. Um, aside from farmers associations or fisher folks associations, uh, there are also private companies which extend help to fishing communities. For instance, Card Bank is a source of credit in times of calamities, which fishermen are unable when fishermen are unable to go out fishing. The Sahara Corporation in Batangas and the Ge Geothermal Power Corporation in Oriental Mindoro are both actively providing assistance to the fishing communities around these lakes. Uh, the Manila Water Corporation was also mentioned by respondents in Laguna as one of those that provided assistance. Uh, there are a variety of projects for fishing communities being carried out by the different institutions. So this range from water resource protection to establishing fishing facilities as well as alternative livelihood sources and capacity enhancements. So all of these are intended to make fishing communities more resilient to the effects of extreme events. Distribution of fishing gears and even motorized bankas is also being carried out in almost all of the study sites. However, as mentioned earlier, only very limited number is provided. And at times there is also an issue of um, mismatch. So. For example, fish nets provided are not the ones needed by the fisher folks, or those provided are usually for saltwater fishing. So, in summary, climate related disturbances in the major lakes in Luzon are typhoons and other water related hazards. Occurrences of typhoons in the last decade significantly affected uh, fishing communities in terms of damages of fishing implements and livelihood sources. So inundation of the communities at prolonged periods posing health risks are some of the major impacts of these hazards. Separation of families during these events 
with some opting to leave uh, their communities in order to pro provide for their members and avert risk for uh, climate related hazards are some of the lasting impacts. So in general, adaptive mechanisms of communities around the major lakes revolve in the maintenance and recovery of um, livelihood sources destroyed by this climate uh, related disturbances or extreme events. So roles of males in the family also include uh, repairs of damages to the house and fishing implements, and in most cases, engagement in alternative forms of livelihood. Female roles are towards maintaining the household in general. Cleanups of debris are the recurrent um, suggested by the rep respondents. In addition, female members uh, assist their husbands in maintaining livelihood through peddling of fish caught and joining in fishing trips. Other roles of females in the family include engagement in other forms of livelihood and seeking loans and credits from microfinancing institutions. So aside from the coping mechanisms adapted by the fishing communities, there are agencies, primarily government institutions with which provide assistance to fishing communities. So the provincial, municipal, and barangay LGUs are the primary providers of assistance to fishing communities. Apart from this, local institutions, the Bureau of um, Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, the SWD, were the national government agencies providing support and assistance frequently mentioned by the respondents. So Protected Area Management Bureau, was also mentioned by respondents in Batangas and Oriental Mindoro. LLDA was cited by a few respondents from um, Laguna. Uh, there are also capacity building activities such as trainings for alternative livelihood opportunities, which are also extended. So fishing facilities include community facilities uh, are also provided. Localization of all for recommendations, so it is recommended that localization of all activities and policies uh, should be in place across all sites. So supplies in fishing operations, availability of credit and assistance options, and increasing support for acquisition of fishing equipment were primary to this um, recommendation. So there were also these were institutional instituted in order to secure that much needed inputs and support are readily available. On the other hand, available livelihood and assistance for fisher folks and their families are also suggested a safety net during the onset of typhoon and monsoon um, seasons. So processing areas and value addition to products should also be provided as important strategies to address the impacts of climate change. It was also imperative for participants to establish um, fish sanctuaries to ensure continuity, diversity, and volume of preferred species in the lakes. Additional trainings and re-echoing activities are also suggested to be pivotal in sustaining knowledge bases. So for local policies, implementation of pervading national, national statutes, particularly proactive prohibition of illegal fishing gears as major policy localization that should be implemented in the major lakes of the zone, implementation of easements, and delineation of aqu aquaculture structure, navigational ways, and buffer zones should also be carefully planned and institu instituted as local policies. So these are some of the photos taken during the field work. The, the lake, uh, Buhi, uh, lake, Bato Lake, and um, Lake Buhi. This is a picture of uh, Sirnarapan. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Ms. Tan, for that comprehensive and insightful presentation. I agree with what you have shared and recommended. Continuous help by the national agencies, especially the LGUs, are really needed to provide support ranging from credit availment, capacity development through trainings, livelihood assistance, to our vulnerable communities and fisher folks affected by the changing climate for them to sustain their lives and provide their to their own families. Thank you. Again, just a reminder, we know that most of you have ideas, comments, or clarifications regarding our presentation. You are free to do so by maximizing the Zoom Q&A chat box and to our Facebook comment section.
Just type in the type it in there and it will be entertained in our open forum later. At this point, let us proceed with our first discussion. We will be reacting and further explaining the presentation made by Ms. Tan. Our first discussion is Dr. Jennifer Marie S. Ampar. She is an assistant professor at the Department of Social Development Services at the College of Human Ecology, University of the Philippines, West Bank, where she teaches undergraduate courses. She finished her Bachelor of Science in Human Ecology, cum laude, in UP Los Baños, and Master of Arts in Sociology in UP de Leman. In 2021, she obtained her PhD in Environment and Human Ecology at the Fenner School of Environment and Society from the Australian National University at Canberra, Australia. Her PhD dissertation was entitled Dynamics of Social Ecological Traps, the Case of Small-Scale Fisheries in the Philippines. Her expertise and research interests are varied, which include social ecological resilience, sustainability of food systems, environment stewardship and education, local community adaptation, disaster risk reduction and management, health and pollution, multi-sectoral partnership and inclusion, among others. Through these research and extension studies and activities, she has published a number of journals and book chapters published in the international journals, reputable international publish publishers. Her research and extension activities enabled her to be involved in the river rehabilitation and cleanup projects in Marilao, Mekawayan, Obando River System human economic empowerment and leadership of indigenous peoples and small colder farmers and fishers in the Philippines. Her passion and energy in achieving excellence in all her endeavors made Dr. Amparo hold various academic positions, some which are associate fellow, technical expert and mentor, chair and member of the various committee in and outside of the university. It is also paved the way to recognize her in the international, national, and university as a level as a scholar, distinguished alumna, and as a recipient of various faculty grants. With her knowledge and expertise, she served as a research person, trainer, and facilitator. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Dr. Jennifer Marie S. Amparo with a big virtual applause. Dr. Amparo, please. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's a generous introduction. And I think that's also one presentation already. <laughs> Thank you, David. All right. So let me share my screen first. So before um, I start the uh, discussion uh, regarding uh, Mom France or Mom Mehmet's uh, paper. So let me, uh, of course, uh, thank uh, Dean Rowena Bakongis and congratulate the organizing team of this webinar. Uh, I would like also to congratulate Miss Maria Francesca uh, Tan or uh, Mam Mehmet, uh, Miss Samantha Geraldine De Los Santos uh, for their presentations this morning. And of course, I'd like to recognize also my co discussant Miss Nasreen Camille Castro from the Climate Reality Project. So uh, we've been partners before um, in one of the webinars also. Okay, so let me uh, indulge me, please, uh, if you could go to slido.com uh, and then uh, type the code CPATH 2021, or you could scan the QR code so you could go into the poll. So we have two questions for uh, this morning uh, for my presentation. So first is, uh, because the title of the webinar is Swim or Sink, no? uh, in terms of the adaptive and the coping uh, strategies, of coastal communities here in the Philippines. So do you think based on the initial presentation of uh, Ms. France or Nam Mehmet, uh, do you think that fishers will swim or sink or will they float? So I added another component, float. Okay, so I'll give um, some time, maybe 30 seconds, okay. Okay, while answering po, marunong po ba tayong lumangoy? Pwede po bang mag-thumbs up, puso-puso, ang marunong lumangoy po dito? Ayan, Miss Mara, the first one who, ano, who raised her hand. Thank you. Okay, alright, so let me see the results. So, ayan, tumataas, bumababa. Okay, thank you very much po. So we have 24 respondents. 25 counting. So majority as of this time is 
50% po will swim. No? Ibig sabihin, um, definitely they will adjust, they will uh, cope, uh, not only cope, but also adapt and change their um, strategies in order for fishers to actually swim this uh, variant or uh, plethora of changes that uh, we've uh, heard from uh, Ms. France. Anna. So not only climate-induced um, changes, but also other changes in the social economic systems. All right, thank you very much. And then next, okay, po. kindly uh, type in your key takeaway or insight from the presentation. Phrase lang po. It could be a word or it could be a phrase. Sige po, type po natin. Okay. Ayan, meron na po isa. Bayanihan. So, uh, definitely in order for them to swim, nabanggit nga ni uh, Ma'am France, no? Yung, um, I think that was a concept of reggaeton. Tama po ba, Ma'am France, no? So, um, ability to collaborate, uh, to work together with different uh, fishers and also different households in the community. Ayan, lumalabas din po ang... Uh, Resilience, yes. Adaptation, we're talking about, again, resilience is the dominant um, um, key takeaway from the initial presentation. But of course, from that, no, makikita po natin ang iba't ibang konsepto under resilience as well. Like when we talk about vulnerability, we talk about recovery. Okay, so thank you very much for that. So, pero matingkad po, no, that we see cooperation, yung bayan niya. Okay, so let me stop share and go to my presentation. So thank you very much for that. Okay. So generally, um, Ms. Franz, in her presentation and in their project, research project, they identified the value of fisheries, uh, not only in the Philippines, but in the global uh, scenario. Um, particularly the Philippines, or the, we are in, the, in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is one of the most biodiverse and in fishery resource-rich area in the world. According to CFDEC, 22% uh, 20, 20, of the world fishery production comes from uh, Southeast Asia in 2015. And we see the growing contribution not only of captured fishery. Ito, ang captured fishery is basically fishers go out and then they use their nets or other fishing gears to uh, catch from the open sea or open waters, as uh, Ms. Mam Franz had mentioned. But we also see the contribution of aquaculture. These are the fish cages, uh, fish ponds. No? Uh, and fisheries, whether it's from uh, majority or from small scale fisheries, are very critical in terms of food security, livelihood, and ecosystem services. Um, Mam Franz also mentioned that their study focused on five critical lakes in the, in the Philippines. Uh, the Philippines has 200,000 hectares of lakes. Um, and 4.4% um, of the total fisheries production in 2015, which is roughly 200,000 metric tons, comes from our lake. And top three of which uh, was included or were included in the study, which is Laguna de Bai, um, of course, Taal Lake, and uh, not included in the study's lake, Danau. But Mam Franz mentioned the biodiversity and the importance of other lakes uh, identified or included in the study. So uh, the next slide shows, um, I saw this book, no? uh, Staying Afloat When the Water Gets Rough. So I think one of the challenges for Filipinos, uh, I don't want to generalize, is to swim. No? Although we're an arch archipelagic uh, country, majority or most of us have a str are struggling in terms of uh, swimming. No? So, but how do we stay afloat when the water gets rough? No, using that metaphor. And uh, on the right side is a picture about how you could survive no? uh, when you are, you, when, for example, your boat capsized. If you see here the concept of flipping, flo floating, and following, no? I think it depends also on the kind of tide. Uh, when there's a rip tide, for example, in Australia, they have a rip tide, they call it a rip tide, you don't follow the tide. You go again, uh, you uh, swim perpendicularly. Uh, through the riptide. Huh? So I use this metaphor in terms of understanding how could fishers then, through their coping and adaptation, flip 
no? and for them to be able to float or for them to be able to swim, for them uh, to prevent them from drowning or prevent their livelihoods and their communities from sinking. The next slide shows uh, if we have future proofing, which is the mantra of our administration for the day, uh, uh, these days, uh, I saw this drown proofing. So it's basically a strategy used uh, to train no? uh, Navy SEALs, for example, in the United States to train them in terms of um, making them uh, prepared in terms of um, instances or events where they're uh, uh, for example, in open sea combat or when uh, uh, their boats or their ships um, capsize, for example. So this is where um, these baby seals are trained, no? literally they are drowned. No? Um, and how they adjust, how they adapt to that situation, because the ability for you to adapt is based on your experience also. How you remember the dynamics at the bottom of the of, of the sea, for example, or uh, at the bottom of the water. So, how do we then, looking at the fishers' um, communities, how do we then drown proof uh, the fishing communities? Okay. So, the presentation will be divided into four. Uh, basically, to just to summarize the key findings from paper number one. Number two is how we then downproof the coastal and lake fishing communities amidst climate change, particularly the contribution of the paper um, to the literature and the research, uh, and also uh, to policy. Number three is swimming with and against the tide, unpacking patterns and dynamics, additional concepts and patterns that we need also to unpack in order for us to understand the adaptive capacity of these fishers. And number four is treading the waters, exploring research and policy pathways. So these are future directions based on the earlier research of uh, Mam Meme and her team. So generally, uh, the paper, uh, the paper of uh, Tanetal in 2021 has three research objectives. Basically, number one is to provide the social economic profile of fishers and fishers household. So basically, fishing uh, is a primary source of livelihoods across uh, the lakeshore communities, and uh, there are two types of fisheries uh, found in in those areas, which is capture fishery, as discussed earlier, and aquaculture as fish cage operators. Um, this could be large scale or small scale, but as we for sure, most of them are small scale uh, operators. Uh, second is, uh, aside from fishing uh, being a primary source of livelihood, land-based occupations are secondary sources of livelihood. Ito yung bilang tricycle drivers, uh, bilang construction workers, or uh, engaging in fish trading, for example. The second objective is to identify the gender roles or the gendered analysis of the adaptive capacity and mechanisms in these communities. So as um, Mehmet and uh, her team mentioned, um, men focus more on protecting livelihood implements and structures, whether it's pre and during uh, the disaster. Um, and second, women focus on household-based preparation and adaptation during disaster. But we want to emphasize, uh, I think the paper also emphasized that the, both the roles complement each other. So it, it doesn't put prime on one role uh, over the other, but it complements it. And this forms a complete picture for the household and the community to be adapted in terms of climate-induced uh, disturbances. So uh, again, we are, um, we are made to remember of these uh, typhoons. So most of the typhoons, if you could see here, the top three typhoons identified in the different areas are um, or, or are recent um, typhoon uh, events, no? the Glenda, Nina, and Nona. And most of these areas are um, uh, or most of these typhoons have caused flooding, which resulted in inability to fish due to bad weather. And for aquaculture, it's the overflowing of, uh, of fish cages no? and this, uh, fish escapes. Uh, also, the paper identified the institutional and organizational support provided by different sectors, not only by the government sector, but also even the private and non-government organization and even the local fishery organizations. Uh, in terms of policy, it focuses more on regulatory functions like uh, policies on illegal fishing, on zoning, and registration of fish cages or fish gears. 
uh, the plans focus more on capacity buildings, fund provision, uh, value addition in terms of the food or the fishery industry, and uh, support for fish trading, for example, by providing or uh, establishing a fish port. Um, again, uh, the paper also highlights the issue of policy, implementation, and provision mismatches. So the second part of the uh, presentation is what's the key contributions of the research based on my initial assessment, initial take of the paper of uh, Ms. Tan and her team. Number one is the value of place-based studies. Boyd, for example, in 2001, gave emphasis no, on the, the, the value of place-based studies as contexts are very critical in nature-based livelihoods like fisheries. And second, yes, uh, I do agree with uh, Ms. Franz when she, he mentioned that she mentioned that most of the vulnerability assessments are done at the regional, national, and even a global scale. But uh, most of uh, a village level and a community level assessment of vulnerability and agitation needs to be further unpacked. Second is uh, they were able to surface multiple and diversity of livelihoods. No? And able to surface the occupational uh, or multiplicity of occupational identity of fishers. Fishers do not just associate themselves as fishers. No? Most of them have multiple livelihoods that help them float uh, during times uh, or difficult times, like uh, during disturbances induced by climate change. And the third one is the gender lens on coping and adaptive strategies in DRR or DRM or disaster risk management. Because uh, usually, even in fisheries management, the voice of women uh, are commonly seen as secondary, as something that would contribute to the primary fisher, who is the uh, who is the man in the family. But uh, as you will see in, as you could see in the presentation of Miss France, and even in my uh, quick um, inputs later. Uh, you will see that the value of women in fishery, in the fishery industry, and even in uh, disaster uh, reduction and management are very critical. So um, what are the things that also needs to be further unpacked in terms of the patterns and dynamics that uh, I think uh, Ma'am Emmet and her team could further look into their data because um, uh, their, their information, the data that they have are very rich, very contextual, and the use of multiple uh, research methods are very uh, noteworthy as well. So uh, one is the gender engagement with different every fishery type. Uh, second is the adaptive capacity in the con context of resilience. Third is the agentic responses of fishers. And the fourth one is the current flip and flow. Uh, strategies, I call them, basically there are the policies in terms of fisheries and disaster risk uh, reduction and mitigation may be insufficient. So the first one is, uh, this is based on my uh, research as well that could inform uh, research on coping and adaptation in uh, the fishery sector. So if you see here on the right side, these are the uh, gendered uh, engagement of household members in uh, in capture fishery. And on the left side, this is a fish farming community in Bulacan. The right side is in Misamis Oriental, uh, where I conducted my survey and uh, KAI and focus group discussion in 2015. So if you look here, uh, most of um, across the different uh, fishery activities from fund preparation to post harvest um, in the fish farming uh, industry, majority of those engaged are men. They're still men because uh, from fish farm, they're the ones who bring it to the market already because there's a supplier there and um, there's um, uh, tinatawag natin mga uh, intermediaries no? that uh, buys the bulk of the fish harvest and then they're the ones who distribute it to different individual sellers. No? So bas uh, basically the role of uh, female or women um, are, uh, they also help in fund preparation, in uh, harvest, in fishing, but the changes uh, in the type, for example, in Mekawayan, uh, there's a uh, earth dike ponds before. So it was easier for women to traverse the fish pond. So they 
um, their country, their help or their support to their husbands were very critical then. But now they're all nets. Uh, earth dikes are kind of eroded, so it makes it more difficult for other family members, especially the young ones, to engage in or help in the fish pond operation. On the right side is the um, from gear preparation to post harvest. So basically, you see the yellow yellow uh, lines is the young female, no? and the gray ones are the adult females contribution to the fishery activities. You see here an increase um, contribution of females. So maybe we could look into that as well uh, in terms of the type of fishery being, is this similarly observed in uh, Laguna de Bai or in other uh, case sites um, mentioned by Ang um, Next is adaptive capacity in the context of social ecological resilience. During the uh, the initial concept or the initial survey that we did, uh, the first part of the program or the presentation, most of you identified resilience. So when we talk about adaptive capacity, it usually associates with resilience, ability to bounce back, ability to, um, despite the cha changes and disturbances and shocks, we are able to adapt, able to uh, try in a given community. So you see here the framework uh, prepared by Limawa uh, et al. Uh, you see here that when we talk about adaptive capacity, we cannot help but also look at the vulnerability, the exposure, the sensitivity, as well as the experience. No? Um, I've read in the paper of uh, Ms. Franz regarding um, with, uh, which is common to, the, to Filipinos and uh, also in coastal communities that uh, we're used to flooding, but we're not used to typhoons plus the habagat. So that makes them unprepared for that. No? So, um, so memory, the definition, basically the perception of people of how they could adapt, perception of the severity of the disaster also uh, uh, affects their expectation, which affects their behavior and their adaptive capacity. So we need to look into that process no? rather than look at adaptive capacity as just an output. All right. So uh, again, also, um, we could also differentiate what cope, what we mean by coping and adaptation. Um, in, in my uh, current research, I, I got the, um, the uh, definition of Bennett in 2016, which is coping strategies are short-term reactive responses, while adaptation refers to a more planned and proactive response. Adaptation are longer term and is significantly affected by materials as well as institutional arrangements. So I recognize uh, the paper of Ms. Franz and uh, her team in terms of focusing also on institutional support for um, adaptation of these fishing communities. So ag again, I'd like to emphasize when we talk about resilience, um, the most common thing is bouncing back. No? You, uh, but now we, we are hearing building back better. No? But uh, uh, we were drawn to this uh, framework because um, resilience is more than just adapting. It's more than just um, remembering, but it needs attentiveness. It needs that your system should be robust. You are also resisting some change. No? And transformation is also critical uh, when we talk about resilience and rebuilding and reconfiguration. It's just not uh, about doing the same things all over again. Um, I'd also like to emphasize uh, the role of the concept of human agency when we talk about fishers. No? Fishers are not passive. Fishers have their, uh, have their uh, agentic response, human agency, which is basically a deliberate action. When you say deliberate, they really plan it out, they really think about it. It's based on their experience, based on their capacity. So uh, I was drawn to this uh, framework by Lister and Colt Hard uh, when they talk about the temporal as well as the relational um, um, concepts no? uh, or dimensions of agency. So we have here four, um, four critical adaptations no? so, uh, of fishers getting back, getting by, getting out, and getting organized. Okay? Usually we see in the paper of Mamamet, uh, Mehmet uh, and Ms. Mam France is the getting uh, getting by, living with it or reducing or modifying their uh, fishing practices or diversifying, they go into their secondary livelihood, etc. So again, in, in, in the paper that I've uh, conducted, based on the different change themes, you see here on the right is the capture fishery. So most of the changes or the adapt or human agentic response uh, employed by fishers are getting back 
uh, because the fish farmers view their enterprise, their fishing industry, as a private enterprise. So they, they don't get back. Get back meaning um, going to the government, reporting violations, and uh, unlike in a capture fishery where um, it's a most of the competition is between a large scale, you know, large scale fisher encroaching the municipal waters, which is the domain, should be the domain of small scale fishers. So here on the right side, most of the small scale fishers are getting back, meaning they are reporting to governments because they don't have control of the large scale uh, uh, as you compare the boats or the ships of the large scale versus the small scale fishers. But I also I, um, recognize what um, um, uh, Mehmet and her team um, um, found out no, that these are not just about reacting and or also this is not just a competition, but sometimes, for example, the overflow of fish cages could be an opportunity for some fishers to gather or harvest more. You know? But of course, the distribution of benefits is, uh, is kind of unequal or uh, uh, in that case. No? Another is, another concept is the fishery exit. Usually we hear, um, so most of these communities have problems with uh, declining fishing, uh, fishes or fishery resources, uh, also in terms of the difficulty uh, in terms of fishing as climate change impacts are being uh, experienced by these fishers. But if you see here, no, uh, and even in the literature, uh, most of the fishers would still stay, no? this orange one and the gray one, would still stay in fishery. Again, uh, the, uh, we asked them no, uh, if they will continue in terms of the temporal scale. No? Will, will you con still continue uh, fishing despite the challenges uh, or the changes in fishery resources, the dwindling fishery resource? So I think, I, I'm not sure if it's surprising or not, but uh, in the literature, it's not surprising because most of the fishers would still continue. But what is um, surprising is when you ask them about their, um, you know, their younger uh, brood or their, for example, their daughters or their um, sons, they would encourage their uh, children not to go into fishing because they perceive fishing as difficult, uh, unstable, unlike when you just go to a call center or a regular uh, land-based job. Okay. Uh, again, um, if you see here, no, very critical for, I'd like you to look into here, uh, uh, this is the captured fishery, the one on the right side. Majority of them would still want to stay within the area. If they change, if ever they change livelihood, they want to stay within the area. Unlike in uh, uh, these fish farms in Bulacan, which is near Valenzuela and the highly urbanized uh, areas, uh, they're open for uh, jobs outside fisheries and jobs outside fisheries and outside their area. So in terms of mobility uh, for urban areas, it's, uh, they're more open, unlike in uh, a more rural area. Okay. Uh, and then lastly is uh, in terms of the strategies, the policies. So I, I echo what uh, Mang Nemek had mentioned, that there's a disconnect with policy narrative with technical solutions. No? Uh, so usually we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about holistic perspective, but if you see solutions, they're geared towards the more technical, just providing fish gears, just providing boats, or sometimes they provide machines or the 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 boat motor without the uh, no no without the boat so that's another story to tell in another um, webinar but anyway second is policy implementation failures so uh, there are policies there's a number of policies in terms of fishery industries for empowering small scale fishers as well but implementation remains to be a challenge not only because of funds but also because of prioritization and the third one is the complexity dilemma because uh, fisheries being a nature-based livelihood is already a complex uh, livelihood and then couple that with climate-induced disturbances, that becomes a double, triple, a triple whammy for these fishers. No? As you see here in the um, quote from a fishery organization president, who's also a woman, we are used to changing seasons and seasonality of fishers and fishes, but we have never been accustomed to pollution. We just wake, woke up with our river turning black and dead fishes in our ponds. So aside from climate-induced um, disturbances, you have problems on pollution. And these typhoons, for example, also aggravate these problems. And then lastly, I think there are three key things that could be uh, tread on. Uh, and as we move forward in our paper and our research, 
uh, maybe we could explore these topics as well. Number one is the changes resulting from these coping adapt adaptation strategies and its impact to food system activities and food systems outcome. As mentioned, fisheries is very critical for local food security and global food security. Second is the concept of feedbacks. No? Um, we need to understand that whenever we do some action, there's a significant reaction that comes with it. So uh, the feedbacks of these coping and adaptation strategies on how fishers escape from poverty and social ecological traps. Uh, because this, uh, the interventions that we might be introducing, for example, providing them with more nets, providing them with boats, providing them with all these technical solutions might aggravate uh, the um, overfishing issue in terms of that area now. So it, in the long term, it's unsustainable. Third is the intersectional identities, not only age, and not only gender, but look at the age as well, as I mentioned in, in my research, the culture or and also the type of fishery and its impact to coping and adaptation mechanisms of fishers. In order for us to create a gender transformative approaches to fishery development and DRM or disaster risk reduction management to have a resilient and sustainable nature-based livelihoods and communities. So with that, maraming salamat po at congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer Amparo, for the great representation of this webinar's title to your presentation and sharing as well your research findings to us. This reminds us that it is really essential na marunong tayong lumangoy hindi man ay mag-float to poop and adapt to adjust to survive in the twist of and turns of tide sa buhay natin. Very well said, Dr. Jennifer Amparo. We will be having more converse, conversation later in our open forum, so stay tuned later. So now, at this point, we now move on with our second speaker for today. She is Ms. Samantha Geraldine G. De Los Santos. She's a recipient of CIPAF's Outstanding Junior Research Award in 2018. She is a university researcher at the Community Innovation Study Center of CIPAF and also currently serving as the head of the Knowledge Management Office of CIPAF. She is a graduate of BS Agriculture Economics in UPLD. In 2020, she completed her Master of Arts in Sociology also in UPLD. Ms. De Los Santos has been involved in various research projects for 10 years. Her interest in climate change studies dates back to one of her stints as a research assistant 10 years ago in a research project on climate change adaptation in SIPA. She led projects on organizational assessment as well as studies on business development services and gender and development. She was also involved in several research projects related to climate change, environment and natural resource economics, and supply chain analysis. Now, let's give a warm virtual applause to our second speaker for today, Ms. Samantha Geraldine G. De Los Santos. Good morning, everyone. I am Samantha Geraldine G. De Los Santos, a university researcher and the current Knowledge Management Office Head of the College of Public Affairs and Development. I am very, very glad to share to you the results of my study, which I did in Sangani Province, Philippines. Now, to share... The title of my study is Adaptation When They Do Not Know Climate Change, Sarangani Fisher Folks Strategies Through the Lens of Symbolic Interactionism. Now, let's start. So the Philippines' blue economy, we do not normally discuss this, especially in the University of the Philippines of Banyas, because basically we are focused on forestry and agriculture. But this time, let's just look at how our... Um, blue economy or the fisheries is affected by climate change. We are one of the largest global producers of fish all over the world. Well, of course, all over the world, as I've said, we're global. From 2008 to 2016, we are top 10 contributors to the global production. We are um, harvesting approximately 142 million metric tons annually. We are one of the exporters of tuna to Japan, Europe, and the U.S. In particular, we are um, our tuna industry started because of the Japanese exploration for the best sashimi they can bring to Japan during the 1960s and 70s. And luckily, we are in the Coral Triangle, which is the epicenter of marine biodiversity. Hence, there's a myriad or there's a 
Uh, there are various species that are available in our oceans. And this also contributes to why we have the best beaches all over the, uh, compared to the other parts of the world. However, our blue economy is not spared from a myriad of problems underwater. Together with uh, these problems, that we are also experiencing the complication of climate change. According to the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, fifth assessment report released in 2014, ocean warming is more evident. How is it more evident? It has resulted to stronger and more frequent typhoons and drier dry seasons that are prolonged. And I will show you what are the examples of this. First is, well, Maybe you guessed it right. That's the satellite image of Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, one of the most, uh, uh, one of the strongest rather, and monstrous in uh, in effect uh, among the typhoons recorded in history. This is the impact of Typhoon Pablo in 2012 in Mindanao. This is a picture of a Davao plant of a plantation of banana in Davao. And this is also a picture in Mindanao of how um, the El Nino Southern Oscillation affected the farmers there. With that, because of this um, stronger typhoons, drier dry seasons, the effects of ocean warming because of climate change, well, we can expect that damage costs will increase. And therefore, our literature says that it really did increase from 244 million US dollars to 2.02 billion US dollars, and as well as more casualties over the years. Um, in particular, Typhoon Pablo, well, historically, let's just say, um, historically, we know that uh, Mindanao does not really experience much typhoons compared to the people who live in Luzon or in central Vis Visayas, right? So what happened is they lost 1.04 billion worth of uh, damages and it claimed 1,268 lives in Mindanao. In particular, 328 fishers from the province of Salangani went missing due to Typhoon Pablo and sadly their bodies were never found. All right, so more of that, of course, it resulted in fishery underperformance. If there's frequent typhoons, well, there's less, less fishing communities and, of course, lower volume of production. Also, um, if, if there will be more typhoons in the future, then it can result to continuous underperformance of our fishery sectors. If fishing communities are bound to experience less catch due to stronger and more frequent typhoons, as well as extreme heat in the ocean, well, of course, their livelihood and there's, uh, their poverty will all the more become uh, extreme. And these are just some of the impacts of climate change that may result later on to issues of food security and even poverty. All right. So that's the effect of climate change in the oceans. Because of that, um, I want to look to the solutions. What are the solutions that are we, that we are doing? Well, by literature, there are only two um, major categories for the solutions and either it's mitigation or adaptation. So mitigation first is dependent on the country's ability to reduce anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions and enhance natural carbon sinks. Um, basically, this is dependent on technology that helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And most of the time, this is implemented by an institution or a company because they have the resources to acquire those, um, those technology. Well, it, that's in particular in the Philippines. Um, for adaptation, this is the sum of capabilities, resources, in, and institutions of a country or region to implement effective adaptation measures. So individually, this can be done depending on your resource at the community level or even at the institutional level. Uh, well, we might say that both mitigation and adaptation may also rely on the policies being implemented in a country. But the focus of this paper is on adaptation rather than mitigation. Why? Because this comes from the forethought that human individuals, uh, human as individuals rather, act as a result of their interaction with other humans and their environment. So going back, this is a uh, 
framed under the theory of symbolic interactionism. So how do households in fishing communities adapt to climate change in relevance to their interaction with its effects? Determining the adaptation strategies of fisher folks as they live through the effects of climate change shall shed a light on their capacity to face the effects of climate change. So how are we going to look at this? What I did is to apply the ecological symbolic approach. This is a theory based on symbolic interactionism, interactionism excuse me, by G.H. Mead and Herbert Bloomer. Okay, so how did I, why did I apply this? Basically, the symbolic interactionism looks at um, how people interact with themselves and with other people to create shared meanings um, and then operate through that shared meanings or inter, uh, uh, create relations because of that shared meanings. At the same, uh, with ecological symbolic approach, what we're doing is that we are, go, we are just extending symbolic interactionism into not just having an interaction with people, but having as well uh, interaction with the environment and the environmental problems that affect human activities. As humans cause the problems in um, in our country, perhaps, or around the world, they also hold the ability and responsibility to solve environmental problems as they experience them. Next, I applied uh, the qualitative determined sequential explanatory mixed methods design to gather and analyze my data. Why did I use qualitatively driven instead of the usual quantitatively driven? Because I wanted to look first at uh, I wanted to look first at what data at, on the quantitative uh, study will come out. And then using qualitative uh, data, I wanted to it enrich uh, what's going to come out from the survey. With that, what I did is I, I used survey first. And from the survey, I selected certain variables to frame the questions that I used for focus group discussions, team format interviews, and in... Um, doing my document reviews. So because of the results of the survey, I was able to identify what are the variables that I wanted to enrich with qualitative data. The quantitative data was then subjected to descriptive statistics, inferential statistics, and for the qualitative data, I used thematic analysis. But for all types of data, I, uh, I incorporated gender analysis because I believe that in the fisheries, in the fishing communities, there are roles that are being played by a woman and a man, and I wanted to capture that. The study area in, was uh, in Sanangani, but I focused on uh, Maitu and in Maasin. Also, the reason why I focused my study here is that during the time when the El Nino phenomenon uh, occurred in the country, the fishing industry was affected and the volume of major marine species produced in the province steadily declined. Well, except for some uh, species of puna, but mainly um, there are a lot of uh, species there, economically significant species that have declined in a level of production from 2014 to 2016. And this was attributed to El Nino. Now, um, for the quantitative part of my study, I employed Cochrane's formula to select my um, sample size um, using a finite, popul uh, finite population. Uh, to, I determined that there were about 329 um, survey respondents that I needed to interview at the span of, uh, of my study. Um, I distributed this depending on how many fisher folks were registered per municipality. So, and also I distributed this, um, I tried to distribute this into an equal number of male and female um, respondents. However, uh, more female, uh, respondents were available at the, at the time of the study. The, there, I collected different types of quantitative uh, and qualitative data, and um, some of this are includes demographic, economic, human capital, or education and training, uh, knowledge and perceptions, and as well as adaptation strategies.
I think we are having some technical difficulties. The, the technical group po is trying to solve the problem. So kindly wait. to catch fish but rather they would really go out into the sea um basically because of um the implementation of the salangani bay protected seascape so they cannot really fish nearby the coastal area um for commercial fishing these are those who are involved in um, catching or har harvesting fish up to um, three gross tons to 150 gross tons there is industrial advancement occurring in the area that affects uh, the fishing industry. There's also population pressure and resource exploitation, basically because as the population increases and if there's not much uh, economic opportunities in the area, most people would go to fishing. It's easy to get a boat and ride that boat and catch a fish for a living. We call the, man uh, the fishers there mananagat as a buana term for Fisher folks, they operate usually a wooden pump boat called Pakura, and they are experts in handline tuna fishing. They are actually well known in Indonesia, and some of Indonesian uh, fishing operators even hire Sarangani fisher folks to catch tuna for the Indonesian economy. Now, for the fisher folks of Sarangani, most of them they just follow their footsteps. That's why they enter the fisheries. They also entered because of possible lucrative income. When you catch a tuna, you would have an income for a month. There's lack of income earning opportunities as well in Sarangani. Now they exit the fisheries due to illness, old age, or if they were voted for an LGU position. Women there, they act as vendors, fish processors, or repairers of fish nets, but most of them are just uh, plain homemakers. They are the ones um, taking care. We cannot say that they're just homemakers, but they're the ones who are taking care of the family and focused on child care. Now, they're the women who sell their, uh, the catch of their um, husbands, they say that they would do that so that yung kanilang profit would 100% be for the family. For the um, participants of the study, 51% of them are female and 48% are male. Are, they are 38 years of age and have lived in the area of residence for 25 years. Um, this means that some of them have just migrated to the area because of the fishing opportunity that is offered by Sarangani Way. For the demographic, demographic profile, 77% of them are married. The average family size is 4.6 and child dependency ratio is at 58.31. This means that for one, every 100 uh, individuals in an area, 58 of them would be dependent to the income earning uh, members of the community. For education and training, medyo mababa po yung education and training nila. They just finished around seven and a half years of um, education. Only 20% of them are... Um, are members of organization and basically because they are beneficiaries of 4P. So members po sila nung parang mga family groups for 4Ps. There is also very low attendance to seminars. And I would like to emphasize that those who have attended seminars here are women who are um, connected with the parish church. And sometimes they get uh, training because um, ihahatid nila yung mga anak nila sa school and they would be invited by the teachers to attend a seminar na kasama yung kanila mga anak. Next, for economic profile, um, medyo mababa yung income nila. You would see that uh, an individual fisher would only earn around 44,000 uh, annual income. Um, well, fishing boat operators, mataas-taas ng forte, but basically because they are the ones who are being hired by commercial scale uh, fishing operators. Medyo mababa pa rin yan kasi malaki naman yung kinikita ng co sa commercial scale. Uh, yun nga lang, in terms of annual income, sila yung malaki-laki sa community. Now, 
they're also affected by seasonality. Mas madaming kita from September, October, November, December until January, February because of weather conditions, less yung weather disturbances during those seasons. Unlike during these times na May, June, July, August uh, until early September na madalas may bagyo or masyado mainit din. And um, some of our Muslim brothers are celebrating um, Ramadan during this quarter. Their source of information primarily is television because um, surprisingly, almost 90% of them have um, access to electricity. They have uh, grid connections. Um, and so they were able to receive information from television at least one to two times a day, lalo lalo na yung mga women. I would like to also emphasize that the men, um, even if they watch um, TV, they would just be watching for the weather to check if they can actually go out for the night to catch fish. Now, for the climate change knowledge, we would see that medyo mababa, 38% lang yung may alam sa climate change na term. I would like to emphasize what I asked here if, if they believe in the term climate change. Only 38.60% said yes, and many of them are women. So, I switch up a little bit yung question ko. Instead of, do you know what climate change is and you know, observe behind you because of climate change, I asked them, what are the changes in climate that you have observed? And they said there have been stronger, more frequent typhoons, wetter, wet seasons, variable rainfall distribution, increase in air temperatures, decrease in fish stock, and sea level rise. They did not really describe sea level rise as it is, but in the following, um, discussions i would picture out i have a picture here describing what sea level is uh sea level rise is so observation in changes in the climate in salangani they are using such words such as malakas madalas dagko lisod kaayo daghan duol to describe that there is really a difference in the past and in the present in terms of the climate in Sarangani. In fact, one of the things that they said is that every single night before there is rain, but now they experience one to two weeks without rain. Okay, so for sea level rise, this is one of the areas in uh, in the community where um, they had to transfer because um, kinainan ng dagat yung kanilang area. The person that has been pointing uh, the person here who has been pointing over there to see is actually telling me that noon, doon pa yung bahay nila, but they had to transfer somewhere else because the sea had uh, sea level had risen. This is an example of uh, a family na ayaw pa nila lumipat kasi they feel like even if kalhati na lang actually yung bahay nila, kanila pa rin yun. But they are actually at risk to further impacts of sea level rise. Now, this is just an account of um, describing na um, they really had to move kasi dati may kalsada pa daw doon, andun pa yung bahay nila, pero dahil pumasok na yung balod or yung uh, alon sa kanilang bahay, naalis na or nakuha na, na yung kanilang mga bahay doon and they have no choice but to transfer. Now, for their adaptation strategies, given those impacts and the changes that they have observed, ano yung ginagawa nila? Even if it's just around 40% yung may alam sa climate change, 61% of them reported ad, uh, practicing adaptation strategies to combat, it, combat its effects. However, 27% are still not doing anything about it. And more women significantly are doing something to adapt to climate change, maybe because if I was just able to uh, correlate this, maybe because of the education and knowledge that they know uh, compared to the men. For the individual, uh, for the adaptation strategies, um, I have uh, categorized it as individual level and institutional level proactive or reactive adaptation. Now, for the proactive adaptation, madami naman silang ginagawa. And if you are going to check on some of these, so um, some of these are actually um, an impact of institutional um, active uh, institutional level adaptation strategies in the area. They are doing waste segregation on their own. They are doing tree planting activities on their own and, and so on and so forth. But there are also um, uh, individual things that they do. For example, yung conservation of electricity. Um, minsan sasabihin natin siguro this must be a mitigation act, uh, 
strategy. But then for them, this is an adaptation strategy so that if they can save up on electricity, they will have extra money for emergency. As for the reactive adaptation, um, if you would check, this is really very individualistic na na action like yung uminom ka ng tubig or use an electric fan, um, take a bath every day. But some of them still are an effect of institutional um, adaptation strategies. So um, I would like to emphasize that yung mga ginagawa natin at the institutional level, if we just continue to interact with the community, um, Later on, it will have an effect. With symbolic interaction, what, what is happening is whenever there, ha there is an interaction between a person, an institution, um, the person would actually um, think about it, realize that probably this is a good thing to do, and then they, later on, they would act uh, towards it. So they would later on adapt what we are teaching. That's why it's very important that we continue the engagement between the communities and the local government units or government agencies in the aspect of DRRM and DRRM and CCA. Now, for reasons for inaction, ano yung sinabi nila? They do not have enough information about climate did not have enough money and material resources. If we would go back at the start of this uh, presentation, ang ibig sabihin ng adaptation would be, dep it depends on the resources, capabilities, and institutions in an area for them to be able to do their adaptation strategy. So it's very important that they know, they have the capability to know, they have the capability to act. So without information and enough resources, it is expected that it will be hard for our fisher folks to adapt to climate change. Now, for our conclusions and recommendations of this study. Education-wise, they are bereft of the knowledge they will need to adapt. However, they have observations and are knowledgeable of policies that the government is implementing. So in the absence of proper education and climate change, they would rely on their interactions to help them create shared meanings and social order to identify proper adaptation strategies to protect themselves. The presence of adaptation strategies, however, does not answer some of the impacts of climate change, such as sea level rise and loss of income due to typhoons and extreme heat. There's also an, they also identified a decrease in fish stock. Although Enai Pass is in place already, I think the fisher folks would benefit from knowing that this is for their good so that food security um, would be at reach for the fisher folks. Additionally, some households are not willing to be relocated, especially those who claim to have titled land properties in the area. There is more to be done in educating the public about climate change and increasing knowledge on the impacts of climate change on fishing communities as they are now heavily reliant on observations and experiences to come up with adaptation strategies. I think this will be very costly for them in the future if we will not equip them with the proper knowledge on how to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Now for the recommendations of the study. So now we have to recognize what the Fisher folks know. Ed effective education start campaign starts with the symbols that they are familiar with. We have to help them affirm or correct what they know about the changes that they have observed with the climate. And secondly, of course, we have to address their low awareness and lack of adaptation, how to continuous education campaign. And I think what's uh, what's best is the continuous uh, engagement of the local government units, government agencies with the community to help them know better about the impacts of climate change. And also, we have to address sea level rise, the most prominent evidence of climate change in Salangani, while uh, mitigating um, the melting of the cryosphere. Uh, uh, it's, it's difficult for them to, of course, appreciate that. But at least at the institutional and individual level, we have to start considering solutions that would address this effect by probably thinking about better uh, uh, planning strategies on uh, migrating them to a safer place. All right. So the under this research undertaking is actually very very important. Since if we really want to uh, help those who are vulnerable, we have to understand first what is happening with them, where are they coming from, 
what are their, their capabilities at this point. And from then on, we have to complement what they have, what they know for a better adaptation strategies in our fishing communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. De La Santos, for delivering the realities about climate change and ultimately how ourselves can be part of the solution. It's also worth sharing what you have uncovered, which is about their cultural and environmental instincts about climate change, since they are in the forefront of the vulnerable and affected ones. Even if they are capacitated with these adaptation strategies, climate change induced impacts and calamities can still jeopardize their living. Again, thank you, Ms. Sam, for that very good presentation. At this moment, we now call on Ms. Nazrin Camil M. Castro, the branch manager of the Climate Change Reality Project Philippines, to give her inputs to the presentation made by Ms. De Los Santos. Ms. Nez Castro is the manager of the Philippine branch of the Climate Reality Project with a current roster of over 1,200. Having worked for almost a decade in the development sector, Ms. Nazca, as she is being called, has gained political and technical expertise on climate policy development and advised key government officials to help shape and advance the country's climate, climate agenda, specifically in strengthening climate finance access, youth and stakeholder engagement, and climate advocacy building nationally and regionally. She's also an advisor of the Philippine Alternate Board Member to the Green Climate Fund, or GCF. She led the organization of the 2016 Climate Vulnerable Forum leadership event that launched in 2016 Low Carbon Monitor Report, one of the first reports on keeping the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal of global warming. She led one of the first reports on keeping panel sessions during the virtual summit, the first high-level online dialogue with heads of state, she also engaged in collaborative researches on sustainable insurance facility and climate risk insurance. Of the micro, small, and medium enterprises sectors of Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines, she earned her degree in political science at De La Salle University, where she was an academic scholar and a Jose Rizal awardee. Now, without further ado, here is Ms. Nazca. Ma'am, the screen is yours. Salamat, Dave. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dean Rowena Bak Bakongis and Director Blanquita Pantoja for inviting me uh, to this uh, panel. I would also like to congratulate our authors, uh, Maria Francesca Tan and, of course, Jerry De Los Santos, who is also a climate reality leader. And I would also like to um, recognize uh, the presence of Dr. Jen Amparo. Um, it is an honor to, to be one of the discussants um, of this, uh, in this webinar, to share this, the, the platform also and the floor with our insightful and innovative authors leading uh, climate resilient pathways for the country. So the main ask uh, for me to present today is a broader perspective and alternative approach on how adaptation and coping strategies should be looked and acted upon based on the research of Ms. Jerry De Los Santos. So my focus would be on the opportunities for coastal communities based on the research findings. Um, at the same time, the flow of my presentation will be uh, on the latest IPCC uh, report findings, which uh, which came after the AR5, um, the assessment report 5 in 2040, which are the special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, a special report on ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate, and of course, the recent uh, assessment report uh, 6 on the climate change physical science basis. And uh, after that, I will focus on the snapshots of climate change impacts to coastal communities. And of course, um, also bringing to highlight the plastic pollution um, using the climate lens. And of course, um, towards the end of my presentation will be the best practices and support that we could be providing the commu coastal communities in Sergangani. Okay. 
I'll be sharing my slides. Okay, here. Okay. So to begin, the recent report from the world's leading uh, body on climate science said that humans have caused an increase of global warming by 1.07 degrees Celsius from pre-industrial levels. We can expect more severe and more frequent climate impacts, with some impacts being irreversible, such as sea, sea level rise that cause storm surges. The agriculture and fishery sector will continue to face the following risks due to climate change. According to the latest report, uh, the AR6, there will be increased frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation events, hot extremes and marine heat waves, and droughts with every additional increment of global warming. Second, concurrent heat waves and droughts are likely to become more frequent. To relate this to the experiences of our man, uh, Mananagat, uh, these projections will definitely affect their income given that, their, that the value of their uh, catch dwindles in the calendar year moves towards summer when their effort increases and yet less volume of fish was being caught during hot months. At 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming, we could expect 4% of our vertebrates, 8% of plants, and 6% of insects to lose at least half their range, as well as 7% of ecosystems shifting to a new biome. Our coral reefs would decline by 70 to 90%, and our marine fisheries would also decline by 1.5 million tons. Crop yields, like maize harvests, will drop by 3%. All of these will be worse at higher levels of global warming. This is according to the special report on 1.5 degrees Celsius. Extinction risk is increased for a large fraction of species, especially as climate change interacts with other stressors. Most plant species cannot naturally shift their geographical ranges. Most small mammals and freshwater mollusks will not be able to keep up. Marine organisms will face progressively lower oxygen levels and higher rates and magnitudes of ocean acidification. Rural areas are expected to experience major impacts on water availability and supply, food security, infrastructure and agricultural incomes, including shifts in the production areas of food and non-food crops around the world. And lastly, climate change is projected to undermine food security because further global warming combined with increasing food demand from increasing population would pose large risks to food security globally. Climate change will reduce renewable surface water and groundwater resources in most dry subtropical regions, intensifying competition for water among sectors. So while the agriculture and fishery sector uh, are vulnerable, it can also help fight climate change, which towards the end of my presentation, I will be uh, breaking down these um, support mechanisms and uh, best practices. Examples of adaptation, mitigation, or cross-cutting actions for the sector include sustainable agriculture and forestry, protection of ecosystems for uh, carbon storage and other ecosystem services, cropland management, grazing land management, and restoration of organic soils. Other options include technological responses, like modernizing upgrading tools and systems, enhancing smallholder access to credit and other critical production resources, strengthening institutions at local to regional levels, and improving market access through trade reforms. And these are all manifested and reflected um, in the assessment report five in 2014. So according to the research of Ms. Uh, Jerry de los Santos, the knowledge of the community on climate change is low and sea level rise is the most observable change in the fishing communities of Sarangani. Sea level rise is one of the slow onset impacts of climate change. As humanity pollutes the atmosphere with greenhouse gases, the planet warms. And as it does so, ice sheets and glaciers melt and warming seawater expands, increasing the volume of world's oceans. The adverse impacts of sea level rise include, so aside from sea level rise being an impact of climate change, it also has uh, other effects 
that um, really impacts the community. So one is close coastal flooding. As sea level rises, higher water levels exacerbate storm surges and strong waves, resulting in deeper coastal floods that last longer and extend further inland. So this results in more damages for coastal communities after the onslaught of extreme weather events. Second is coastal erosion. Coastal erosion is a process by which, by which local sea level rise, wear down or carry away rocks, soils, and or sands along the coast. It increases further when sea level rise is accompanied by other climate change impacts, such as more frequent and severe storms. It will greatly affect coastal communities, including tourism, as prime beachfront properties and recreational areas are washed away by rising waters. It should be noted that the research also highlighted that aside from agriculture and fishing, which are among the four um, major sources of livelihood in Sarangani, aquaculture and tourism are the other two. So another is salinity or salt water intrusion. So salt intrusion is the movement of uh, saline water into freshwater aquifers, resulting in contamination of drinking water resources for the communities. Rising sea levels contribute to the increase in the salinity of both groundwater and surface water sources of drinking water, thereby one, affecting availability of quality of source waters for drinking water utilities, two, um, stunting, um, sorry, stunting or even killing crops and plants, and lastly, increasing the risk of vector borne and diarrheal disease for humans. And lastly, ocean acidification. Uh, when the carbon dioxide touches the oceans, it produces carbonic acid, which makes the ocean acidic. Ocean acidification impacts us in terms of the marine resources, which supports a well being. Uh, livelihood and economic bloodline of most of our coastal communities. It also affects the food chain of everyone in the universe, thus affecting biodiversity. biodiversity. So according to the latest report of IPCC, which is uh, AR6 Physical Science Basis, sea level rise in Asia has increased faster than the global average and will continue to do so in the coming years. This is consistent with the observed trend and projection of our State Weather Bureau PAGASA in its 2018 report. This should remind us that we cannot afford to be passive in addressing the threat of sea level rise in the country, which is also highlighted in um, the research of Ms. De Los Santos. It may not be as dramatic as extreme weather events like typhoons, but it will have devastating consequences on our coastal communities where more than half of the Filipino population is residing. And of course, um, it's also evident that um, because of warming seas, there's also an effect to our corals, which is coral bleaching, which is one of the impacts of warming oceans caused by the warming planet. It refers to the phenomenon when corals lose their vibrant colors and turn white because warming oceans are causing corals to drive out algae. Coral bleaching matters because once the corals die, reefs rarely come back. With few corals surviving, they struggle to reproduce. Because of this, entire coral reef ecosystems on which people and marine wildlife depend deteriorate. When coral reefs deteriorate, we lose natural barriers that absorb the force of waves and storm surges that keeps our uh, co coastal communities relatively safe. And without coral reefs, Coastal communities must rely more on man-made seawalls that are expensive, less effective, and environmentally damaging to construct. According to the UN Environment, by 2050, our oceans could contain more plastic than fish. More than 8.3 billion tons of plastic has been produced since the 1950s. But majority, which is 79%, has accumulated in landfills, dumps, or the environment. About 12% has been incinerated or only, and only 9% of all plastic waste has been recycled. The Philippines is considered the top plastic polluting country with 35% of its plastic waste leaked to the open environment, while 33% are disposed to landfills and dump sites. This is based on a 2.15 million tons of plastic consumption. 
Quite recently, 19 Philippine rivers are listed in the world's top 50 plastic emitting rivers that carry plastic waste into the ocean. Plastic pollution affects human and marine health in so many ways. Uh, one, plastic litter can be mistaken by food, by seabirds, fish, and other animals. Plastics can also entangle and suffocate these animals. Plastics do not biodegrade, but plastics do not biodegrade, but only break down into smaller microplastics. And when consumed by fish, they enter our food chain. Second, populations residing near open dump sites can also acquire diseases from insects and find breathing ground in open dumps. Third, open dumps can also contaminate groundwater and surface water, further exacerbating the salinity of uh, water because of sea level rise. Fourth, the greenhouse gas emissions in the production until the disposal of plastics can affect health and contribute further to global warming and climate change. And lastly, litter and mismanaged waste can also clog waterways and increase incidence of flooding. So fisher folks avoided the burning of plastics as an adaptation strategy, which is mentioned in the research, to avoid pollution going into the sea. Uh, deepening the understanding of the community on plastics using climate lens will further drive mitigation initiatives so that they can preserve their lives and livelihoods. So now um, it's mentioned in the research that uh, or the women uh, in the coastal communities are, are homemakers, but they do have more um, knowledge on uh, climate change because uh, they stay at home, they have the opportunity to um, listen and watch on televisions. And of course, they are homemakers, they tend to their children, bringing them to schools also gives them an opportunity to um, attend trainings. So um, in this section, I would just like to highlight the role of education um, in women in climate change adaptation, which also presents an opportunity for the coastal communities in Sergandani. So persistent gender inequality and harmful gender norms, especially in low-income areas such as coastal communities, translate to more adolescent girls and women living in poverty being exposed to risks of early and or forced child marriages and facing disruptions in their education. These in turn dramatically limit women's resilience and adaptive capacity. They hamper women's capacity and potential to be actors of climate change. Second, despite women being disproportionately affected by climate change, it must be noted, however, that in most cases, women have the practical knowledge and solutions to adapt to changing environmental conditions due to their usual role as caregivers and household managers. So it reaffirms uh, the, the findings of the research. But they are still largely untapped resources because of their limited access to political decision-making spheres and lack of support in terms of education, training, and technology. Uh, wherein in the study, it's highlighted that um, for effective adaptation initiatives in the community to be successful and thrive, there should be close coordination with policymakers, decision makers among uh, community members. So advancing gender uh, equality, women's empowerment, and delivering quality education to women and girls can be powerful tools in the fight against climate change. However, a study of 160 nationally determined contributions, these are uh, documents of our mitigation targets to reduce greenhouse gas emission by 2030 or 2050, which is submitted to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, shows that only three NDCs mentioned girls at all. So these are uh, Venezuela, Malawi, and Zambia. If we truly want to empower our citizens for climate action, investing in girls' education, especially those in underserved communities, should be a top priority. And lastly, many studies have highlighted that placing equity and uh, front and center of climate change adaptation policies and programs will make these interventions truly transformative rather than just instrumental. Genuine adaptation recognizes the root drivers of um, inequity and how these are making certain sectors, such as women and girls, more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So now, which brings me to um, the best practices that could be um, opportunities 
on the uh, recommendations uh, based on the studies of and findings and recommendations of the research. One is climate field schools. The establishment of climate field schools or CFS should uh, could address the apparent lack of awareness of residents, especially fisher folks in coastal communities. An innovative approach to help farmers and fisher folks adapt to the impact of climate change. The first climate finance, uh, climate field school program in the Philippines was established by the municipal government of Domangas, Iloilo in 2007. Through the climate field school, farmers are provided in localized, with localized weather forecasts and use weather information in adjusting crop management and fishing practices. Its effectiveness has led the Department of Agriculture and the Climate Change Commission to implement the program across several local governments. Uh, in the country. In fact, one of the approved projects under the People's Survival Fund, which is an annual appropriation that provides much needed predictable funds in support of local climate change adaptation initiatives, is the establishment of climate finance, a climate field school for farmers and fisher folk in the municipality of Del Carmen, Sherdal Island, Surigao del Norte. The province of Sarangani could establish and design its own climate field school through PSF funding. It must be noted that Sarangani is one of the few local government units that have produced a project proposal approved by the PSF board. The approved project is entitled Saob, Watershed Ecosystem Rehabilitation and Flood Risk Reduction for Increased Resilience. It aims to develop Saob watershed ecosystem resiliency and community protection through watershed governance, build the capacities of Maitong um, municipal government development partners, beneficiaries and stakeholders to adapt to flood risks and impacts of climate change variability, elevate poverty through agroforestry development and establish riverbank protection. Second is solar powered cold storage. With proper cold storage, farmers and fisher folk are given the opportunity to reduce food and income losses when natural disasters occur. Having access to such facilities plays a crucial role in extending the shelf life of their produce and fish catch and diversify their products amid changing weather patterns due to climate change. The good news is that the Department of Agriculture has recently announced that it will soon install solar powered storage and food production areas to help farmers maintain the quality of agricultural product and prevent post harvest losses. Our hope is that this will be followed by the establishment of eco fishing ports with solar powered fish food storage and ice making installations in the country to support fisher folk communities. And lastly, I would like to share the role of climate risk insurance. Uh, MSMEs are the bedrocks of the economy, and this is true in Southeast Asia and all other vulnerable nations. During a shock, micro, small, and medium sized enterprises may deplete savings, sell productive assets, or be forced to borrow at high interest rates to bridge uh, the funding gap. Furthermore, MSMEs are constantly threatened by the increasing frequency and severity of climate-related risks such as floods and droughts, like in the case of um, the coastal communities in Sarangan. The low awareness of MSMEs on climate-related business risk and risk management techniques and low level of financial literacy are also contributory to the low adaptive capacities of MSMEs. Insurance can help enhance the risk management capacities of MSMEs, absorb financial shocks from climate-related losses, and de risk the implementation of cost-saving renewable energy and energy efficiency infrastructure. So one example is a sustainability insurance facility, which provides climate smart insurance for MSMEs and the vulnerable people that depend on them. The facility aims to build local and regional insurance markets to help better absorb risk, develop resilient business models, and free up public and private resources for investment in the resilience and growth of our economies and people. So this, is, this was established by the V20 or the vulnerable group of 20 uh, finance ministers of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which includes the Philippines. And it is a project pipeline development facility that will assist 
B20 economies in scoping the financial protection needs of their MSMEs in order to build their resilience to climate change impacts. It will also facilitate the concept and proposal development for submission to funding vehicles relevant to climate and disaster risk, financial and insurance, mobilizing international financial and technical assistance to develop customized climate smart insurance solutions for SME, um, MSMEs and close the financial protection gap. So this facility aims to protect MSMEs that account for 29% of GDP and employ 78% of our workforce. Uh, in the case of the Philippines, 99% uh, of our um, of the economy uh, is being run by MSMEs. So um, again, it, it accounts for 29% of GDP and employs 78% of workforce in vulnerable economies. Worsening climate disasters would further drag down economic productivity and resilience of MSME sector. And if they um, if they are not capacitated, um, they do not have um, adequate insurance protection and investment capacity to absorb financial shocks and the risk, the low carbon transition. So overall, even though um, at the global level, um, the Global Commission on Adaptation recognizes the importance of locally led adaptation, uh, where they said that communities on the front lines of climate change, like uh, our Mananagat in Sarangani, are often the most uh, active and innovative in developing adaptation solutions. Yet, too often they lack access to the resources and power needed to implement them effectively. Locally led adaptation can unlock, support, and leverage the enormous potential and the uh, creativity of individuals and communities to develop solutions based on their experiences with local manifestations of climate change impacts. As a consequence, adaptation action will be more effective and more accountable to communities. And lastly, uh, perhaps um, I know the focus of the, the, the research is really on the adaptation uh, mechanisms and measures uh, of our fisher folks in Sarangan. But basically in the country, our own NDC um, spells out the mitigation targets of the country, uh, which functions um, as an adaptation measure as well. So that, that ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nas Castro, for that presentation and sharing with us the Climate Reality Project Philippines. Thank you for providing an enriching discussion on the impacts of climate change on coastal communities and highlighting the importance of locally-led initiatives and adaptation strategies. It's awakening to know how at risk they are and climate change is. Definitely an emergency we need to solve. Now on this part, we now move on with one of the most exciting parts of the program, the Open Forum. To assist us with the open forum, I will now call on my co-moderator, Ms. Roxanne Banalo, to facilitate our open forum. Rox? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. So thank you very much, Sir David. Good morning, everyone. I am Roxanne Banalo, a University Research Associate at the Community Innovation Study Center of CIPAF UPLD. I will be co-moderating this open forum. So before we start, may I kindly request the speakers and discussants to prepare opening their microphones. Okay, thank you. Uh, for this open forum, I will be reading some of the questions in the Q&A tab and chat box, as well as those from Facebook Live. Participants can still send their questions, and if the question, question is for a particular person, kindly indicate the name of the speaker or discussant. To ensure that questions are relevant to the scope of the presentation, members of our team are collating and moderating them behind the scenes. Uh, participants can still send their questions and we will try our best to accommodate all questions given the remaining time. So, for the first question, 
what do you think are the key aspects for the collective adaptation strategies in the community? So, Ms. Frances Catan, can you answer the question? Thank you. Thank you, Rox. Uh, before I answer the question, I'd like to thank Dr. Ampara for her insightful comments. This would help us in improving the paper. No? So um, key aspects for collective uh, adaptation strategies in the community. So when we say collective, meaning um, there should be agreement among stakeholders in the community. So it is important that uh, these communities have awareness or mutual shared understanding of the current situation in the community. So we can also look at the social, economic, and political settings of the community as this can also provide um, opportunities or challenges for communities uh, to adapt. Uh, in planning also, it's, uh, it should be a collective strategy. So stakeholders should also be involved. That's why a part of our research uh, in study three, which is the capacitating fishing communities in um, on climate change adaptation strategies towards um, improved resiliency, we introduced an approach, which is the eye care approach, or it is the um, uh, increased uh, community awareness and resilience uh, enhancement approach. So this approach is made uh, basically focused on collaborative efforts efforts for awareness raising of uh, within the communities and then uh, adaptation and resilience um, practices and strategies and of course the participatory community resilience action planning um, this would uh, enable these communities to provide locally uh, develop a specific uh, strategy so it's important that that's why when we conducted the study when the communities planned you know for their um, strategies, uh, the, um, the municipal, uh, provincial, and barangay LGUs were involved during the planning. So it's actually a collaborative effort. So awareness, and then should also look at the social, economic, and political settings. Uh, and in planning, everyone should be involved to address, you know, to have a collective adaptation strategy within the community so that everyone will be able to uh, uh, join in the strategy you know, the, in the, within the so thank you Miss friends for answering that question can Miss Jerry answer the same question okay um uh, before uh, we conduct, actually, I was also part, uh, for our viewers, um, I was also part of the project that Ms. Uh, Tan conducted. I was one of the research uh, research um, researchers <laughs> for that project. And um, way before this, I know, way be even way before this uh, project, I already had an experience with another um Adaptation Strategies Project, uh, if you are familiar with the Os Oscar M. Lopez uh, uh, Center, uh, we were able to bag one of uh, um, uh, funding in back in 2014. And one of the outputs of, this, of that study is actually that if you want to increase adaptation strategies in the community, there are several resources that you have to look at. And if you want to increase um, the capacity of the people to be able to conduct their collective adaptation strategies, there should be sufficient social capital that is available in that area. So social capital would actually be as simple as yung interaction nila, relationship with the people within the community, uh, organizations present, whether that's formal and informal. So if we want a collective adaptation to, in, to occur or even increase in occurrence in a community, there should be um, connections built within that community. Hindi lang, sila, um, hindi lang sila yung katulad sa urban areas that families are very individualistic. Uh, there should be a network uh, existing in that area for them to be able to do things collectively. So thank you, Miss Jerry. Um, Dr. Amparo, do you have something to share? Yes, thank you very much. I just would like to emphasize, oops, but could you hear me? Yes. 
Spock, yes, Spock. Okay, pamilihan po ang aking video. Anyway, uh, so I'd like to also emphasize coming from what uh, Ma'am Sam and Ma'am Mehmet shared is also in terms of uh, the fishery organizations or the local fishery uh, or fisher folks organization because um, based on uh, our initial study in the fish farming community in Bulacan and also the aquaculture in, and capture fishery in Mesanis Occidental and Oriental, um, fishery exit uh, based on reduced fishery catch um, there's a significant fact uh, there's a significant impact in terms of membership of fishers uh, in, in these organizations because most of the interventions of national government agencies and local government units as we know are coursed through uh, fishery organizations so it's very important as uh, for example, for the eye care um, approach and also the collective adaptation to really work with these uh, fishery organizations as membership of fishers to these organizations, um, help them uh, at least adapt or uh, try in terms of uh, changes in fishery catch and harvest. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amparo. Um, Ms. Nas? Is there something you can share? Oh. Okay, I will share. Um, I would just like to emphasize. Um, I think it's also we also share the same stance that uh, fisher folks um, should also be a shareholder in the planning. So, um, in terms of the experience of um, putting up, uh, I'll go on to the case of building up the ecosystem of um, implementation for an insurance, uh, climate risk insurance for a certain uh, community or MSMEs. Um, usually the experiences of our MF, MSMEs is that they do not fully understand uh, the particular climate risk they face and how these translate into impacts for um, their operations and of course balance sheets. At the end of the day, mm. it's about business. And now here comes the role of universities research networks and insurers like uh, UPLB. So their role is to identify whether risk related loss data needs and efficiency or productivity gains for identifying perhaps um, particular technology to help um, our MSME sector. Um, aside from that, uh, our universities are also, also have the role to uh, develop and enhance access to actionable weather weather risk. It's just not um, it's not enough to hear about weather forecast, but how is this translated to the specific sectors and livelihoods of our fisher folks? So the um, universities could provide a menu of low carbon technology and options also to realize efficiency or productivity gains for our fisher folks. And of course, hindi mawawala dyan yung uh, finance ministers natin in the national government or perhaps in the LGU because um, at the end of the day, our fisher folks, our communities need financial assistance to be able to um, actualize ano to mga pro uh, projects na to, um, these programs that could help them really um, adapt to the changing climate. And of course, um, the role of the private sector, um, aside from providing um, capacity building uh, financial uh, materials and resources, they could also develop the tools and train MSMEs. So, katulad ng mga role ng commercial um, uh, commercial companies na pinag, uh, pinagdadalhan ng mga fish catch of our fisher folks in Sagangani, they could um, take and assume that role for the fisher folks. So, it's building an ecosystem, hindi lang siya um, working in silos. So for an adaptation measure and mechanism to be effective, all um, members of the community should act together. Thank you very much, Ms. Nance, and also for the suggestions. Uh, so for our next question, this came from um, Facebook Live. This was sent by uh, Ms. Dulce Elazegui. So the question is, looking at the issues which apparently remain over the years, from a policy perspective, has been there any effort to look at the innovations that have taken place since the enactment of climate change and DRRM acts a decade ago? 
Same with governance, wherein there is some dichotomy for municipal, commercial, and aquaculture. So, who would want to volunteer to answer the question? Yeah, I think I can answer the question. Um, Tita Dulce is actually one of my mentors when it comes to climate change studies. So I'm very glad that she is here to listen even over Facebook. Uh, hello, Tita. Um, uh, in my study, I that is one of the goals um, of my uh, research. Um, basically, this is based on my master's thesis. And one of the questions during the time that I was writing my thesis is after like 10 years since uh, the Climate Change Act of 2009 and around uh, eight or eight years or so um, since the uh, implementation of the DRRM Act of 2010. My question is, how far have we gone uh, since nung na-implement to mga policies na to? And yes, I've looked into that, although this was not part of the presentation that I had. Um, on the, ano, on the, on the policy side, um, if we are going to analyze analyze our policies, yes, they were able to identify who should be the stakeholders who are the most vulnerable. In fact, the most vulnerable are the women and children. But when we now, when I now was able to complete my study, we are still so far from what we want to achieve when it comes to climate, uh, climate change, yung adaptation and mitigation natin na strategies. We are still very far from what we want to achieve. When in fact, by 2030, we're supposed to be able to uh, achieve this as one of the sustainable development goals. So um, going back to her question, um, Medyo madami pa talagang efforts tayo na kailangan natin gawin. One of the things that I also discovered is that sometimes we are, we may feel in the scientific community that we have been talking about climate change over and over and again. And sometimes it feels so cliche na or nakakasawa ng pag-usapan. But when you go to the communities, what are they doing actually? First, they still have little knowledge of what, what it is about. They still have very little knowledge about what are its impacts to their livelihood and maybe to their properties and to their lives. For example, we can highlight yung nangyayari sa Sarangani. I was not able to explain this further during my presentation, but for them, sea level rise is actually attributed to tuna fishing. Ang tingin nila is that the reason why the sea level is rising is because of uh, the use of boulders para bumaba yung handline fish, yung yung uh, tawag doon, tanse sa, sa fishing line para bumaba siya. So, ang logic nila is para lang yung balde na puno ng tubig. Lagyan mo ng boulder, aapaw yung tubig. But in reality, our science doesn't tell us that that's what happened. That's what's, that's what's happening. So, um, if we will look at it, and dami pa talaga. There's a lot of things that we still need to do in terms of, yes, community education, policy, implementation, and stuff. Thank you, Ms. Jerry. So the question is addressed to both speakers. So Ms. Franz, can you answer the question of Dr. Elsegi? Uh, thank you, Tita Dose. No, I agree with Sam. No, when when we conducted this research, no, uh, Sam is also included. Even rocks, no, was with us. Uh, we asked them the mga policies, no. So they have certain policies which uh, address yung mga uh, effects of climate change. Like, for example, actually, hindi naman direct uh, impacts, no? but, um, but it's actually, when it comes to implementation, they, they lack no? yung strengthening ng implementation. No? So I think um, we have a long way pa to really achieve yung climate change uh, yung na, na, na sign. No? No? So, um, we should really uh, raise awareness, I think, no, so that all the stakeholders involved within the area, kung san mang area yan, no, will be able to really understand what is happening so that um, when policies are um, developed or ano, no, legislated, no, they will be able to understand why this is needed. So I think we should really look into that path. You know, awareness raising within the communities. 
that are affected by not just the climate related disturbances or ano but uh, as a whole yung mga problems within the community yes uh, i can see that miss naz is raising her hand yeah Okay, I would just like to um, share also the findings of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative last October 2020, which revealed that most Filipinos were concerned about the effects of climate change on their health, among other potential impacts, because um, primarily because of the pandemic. Overall, the study has found a low level of public awareness about climate change among Filipinos. So it's also a reflection that we're not yet there. <laughs> Um, so going back to the question of Ms. Dulce, um, at the national average, most respondents had not heard of and did not feel well informed about climate change, which is 60%. And only 12% of respondents had heard a lot or felt extremely well informed about it, which is 12%. Comparing to um, the Sarangan community, na, um, I think it also reflects um, this national um, number na mababa nga ang awareness of, ng Filipinos on climate change. Primarily, um, it could also be on the questioning, which um, I really appreciated when Jerry um, adjusted her question na baka doon sa physical experiences, they could relate what climate change is. Now, um, I think the role of uh, the public uh, is to ask the hard, the difficult, and critical questions uh, about climate change. So going back to, um, since we're talking about policy, going back to the Climate Change Act, it's under Section 11, which is a framework strategy and program on climate change. It says here that the Climate Change Commission shall, within six months from the effectivity of this act, formulate a framework strategy on climate change, which we now have. However, the framework shall serve as the basis for a program for climate change planning, research and development, extension and monitoring of activities to protect vulnerable communities from the adverse uh, effects of climate change. The framework shall be formulated based on the climate change vulnerabilities, specific adaptation needs, and mitigation potential and in accordance with the international agreement. And the framework shall be reviewed every three years or as may be deemed necessary. So, think um leaving you with that um provision of the law um we have a responsibility the rest of the public to um really uh, ask our government uh, officials of, about these difficult and challenging questions thank you very much um dr amparo thank you roxanne um in terms of uh, fisheries governance and the impact of uh, climate change um, and the question on uh, governance innovations, for example, um, because um, Mam France emphasized in her paper the mismatch in terms of the interventions provided by the government and with that of the needs of the community and that of the fishers. So because when we talk about, of course, climate change and when we talk about water quality and fisheries governance, it goes beyond governance borders or it goes beyond one LGU or even one country. So um, the, um, the multi-stakeholder body or coordinating um, organization or institution is very critical. So um, currently under the Clean Water Act, uh, we have the Water Quality Management Act that forms the Water Quality Management Board. Uh, in terms of aquaculture, we have, uh, for example, mariculture. Um, in the current policy of the FAR, um, the uh, different LGUs and uh, different stakeholders are required to form what we call the uh, Mariculture Executive Management Board. So both these governing boards are made up of not only the LGUs and NGAs or national government agencies, but also NGOs, uh, local fisheries organizations, um, and also some industry uh, members or uh, private sector. So, uh, of course, there's still some uh, gaps in terms of the implementation and coordination, but these are already existing governance platforms that we could utilize in terms of engaging these different uh, sectors uh, in terms of uh, marrying science, policy, and practice. 
at the same time, I'd like to also challenge, uh, most of us are from the academe and also from uh, the NGO, uh, the role of the academe and NGO as institutional brokers. Uh, usually we have research, we have the capacity to communicate our our, our research that could inform policy and also practice. So we could, um, like what uh, Nazrin, uh, Naz and uh, her team is doing, and also uh, the University of the Philippines in terms of our research and extension, uh, maximize that institutional brokering um, capacity in terms of uh, coordinating different stakeholders in understanding climate change and it, its impact to different uh, livelihoods like fisheries. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope that the question uh, that Ms. Elasegi is satisfied with the answers of our speakers and discussants. So, um, in relation to the first question, um, we, we know we have this loss uh, regarding fisheries and climate change. So, in the community level, um, what do you think are the ways that we can strengthen the implementation of these laws. Who would want to volunteer answering? Yeah, answer. <laughs> um, as I've been emphasizing earlier, no? uh, awareness. Awareness is very important. So if the people or the community uh, the people within the community are aware of what is happening and if laws to address this, um, for example, problems will be uh, addressed. No? So if they're aware of what the uh, positive, for example, um, what the pa what positive um, results will be uh, from the policies. No? So I think uh, the, the laws will be uh, no, implemented or strengthened within the community. So there should be awareness really within the community. So what are the positive and negative maybe uh, effects of if, if loss will be implemented? No? So, yeah. um, I would like to follow through dun sa sagot din uh, on awareness. Yes, definitely. That is one of the things that we have to increase in the communities. Also, we also uh, also we have to look at the nexus of um, agencies present in an area. For example, in Salangani, the local government cannot just plan uh, the strategies or the programs there because the um, coastal area there is part of the uh, Sarangani Bay protected uh, seascape. So it means all the activities within that area should go through the um, protected area superintendent. Um, so we, ano siya, parang DNR should also be present in that area. And the good thing about what is happening um, in Sarangani, even before matapos ako dun sa study ko, is they're already uh, creating um, a plan together with USAID on how to uh, make sustainable, uh, to create a sustainable management, uh, fishery management plan uh, in Sarangani Bay Area. So it involves, um, it actually involves um uh, Yung uh, fisher folks associations, cooperatives, the local government units, and even our national agencies in drafting that plan. So, um, in so in 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 essence, if we are going to look at it, um, we cannot just, of course, in the battle of climate change, we cannot just always rely on what the community can do, what are the resources there. But it's very important that they have that they have the support from our national agencies. And then you also add other efforts of non-government non agencies in the area who could be stakeholders as well in creating a, a plan. In fact, as of now, um, I don't know if, but if you would look at Google, there are already um, an impact for that, ano, yung Salangani be protected seascapes. Seascape, um, they're already finding it that there's a lot more dolphins in the area. There's a lot more turtles that are being released in the area. The people are becoming a little bit more aware that, hey, we have to protect our natural resource because if we don't protect this, 
tayo din yung mawalan, tayo din yung walang makukuha, wala tayong mahuhuli for our families. Yes, Ma'am Ness, what can you think, add? Rocks. Um, I'll add lang siguro, um, reframing the, the question, what can TSOs do to support our fisher folks in implementing uh, these existing policies and programs? And of course, um, in, um, in, um, in implementing also climate finance. So as a climate finance architecture takes shape globally and nationally, the role of civil society organizations have solidified that it could be one, partners of governments in the development of climate change adaptation and mitigation project proposals for climate finance mechanisms, like in the case of People's Survival Fund and also um, the Green Climate Fund. Second is effective watchdogs to ensure accountability and transparency in the flow of climate finance to beneficiary communities. May it be sourced internationally or, of course, more importantly, kung galing ito sa pera ng bayan. In Pangatlo, implementer of capacity building activities to strengthen stakeholders' understanding of different climate finance modalities and processes. It's not only that we're giving them, uh, um, uh, uh, parang guiding them in the process to access uh, financing, but also capacitating them that in the future, seed money lang to, they could further expand kung ano yung nakuha nilang financing. And lastly, um, I would just like to compliment yung sinabi ni uh, Professor Amparo uh, that um, CSOs um, can also bridge between research and risk information institutions, the media, and the general public to improve people's access to available climate information and services. So with the proximity to the communities and robust relationship with media organizations of CSOs, because they are our ears um, and eyes on the ground, they can help government and academic institutions in translating data into actionable information that could be used in climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Like in the case of the climate change, uh, Philipp uh, climate change reality, sorry, climate reality project Philippines, um, the role of our climate reality leaders, which is now at 1,200 plus leaders all over the Philippines, is to be uh, agents of information. Um, they also have the role of fact-checking, giving out presentation, and of course, yung, yung simula, awareness raising to, um, to our fence-seaters na, na climate deniers pa rin. So, yeah. Salamat. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Amparo, is there something you want to add po? Uh, siguro, it's really more of... Ay. <laughs> so I think it's really more of um, um, it's more of thinking deeper in terms of um, one um, usually when we see the policies and programs uh, currently implemented um, in our society, it's really more especially when we talk about fisheries, it really focuses on regulatory. Um, like uh, illegal fishing dito, ito yung buffer zone, ito yung conservation zone. Uh, but yeah, we'd like to emphasize also no, that um, the role of power dynamics as well as the balance between carrot and stick when we talk about policies. No? Uh, the, aside from just providing the stick, we should provide the incentive. Why should I conserve? Why should I uh, have this particular support, this particular initiative no, for the um, for the fishers. Uh, second is in terms of power dynamics, for example, um, it's not always a straightforward implementation of policies. Like for example, uh, we have a 15 uh, kilometer um, zone for the municipal waters, meaning small scale fishers uh, are, the, are the ones that should, you know, should fish there. Commercial fishers or large scale fishers are banned to fish there. But if uh, during our field work in the different uh, coastal communities, there are instances that it's the small scale fishers who invites the large scale uh, or commercial fishers to go into their areas, like what they call the payao. Payao are the fisher, fishing, fishing aggregated devices. So usually uh, those are the breeding um, areas for the fish. So some small scale fishers would um, invite these uh, commercial fishers to 
get it because they have bigger nets, no? So it's easier instead of them, you know, getting uh, 10 times na iyong hold pa nila yung net and get, getting the, ano. But for one big net, then makukuha na nila and then they just get a percentage from the, ano, uh, from the commercial fishers. So those nuances in terms of implementation, I think uh, that's the value of um, uh, field work done by CSOs and research done by um, uh by the academia so it could inform uh, policy and it could inform implementation um another is uh, looking at policy implementation as a process so um there's a need to continually review you know, the policies uh there's a con uh, continuous need for monitoring and evaluation uh, because uh especially with uh, our current situation in terms of climate change and uh, fast changing social economic uh, context of uh, different uh, communities. No? So we need to regularly um, unpack those policies. No? Because what is happening is we just have a one-fits-all policy and then we implement it to different areas. So place-based and context-based research, uh, like what is being done by CPAF right now, is, uh, is a great initiative. So thank you. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, we could accommodate one last question. So the question is, um, what are the ways you think that the fishing industry or um, the communities in the Philippines can reduce its own greenhouse gas emissions? So, anyone can <laughs> answer? answer. Um, maybe, uh, no, um, Ms. Nas mentioned yung mga solar, no? so maybe, I, I, I don't know if it's possible that our bankers can use solar power motors, you know, maybe, or they could uh, implement scheduling of fishing to uh, reduce uh, emissions of greenhouse from the diesel that this um, fishers actually use. Not sure. <laughs> that. Thank you. So, is uh, CK, yes, but Ms. Uh, um, Dr. Amparo. Um, maybe one example is um, one issue when it, when it comes to uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions is, of course, these fishers, when there's reduced catch, in, in their in the municipal waters is there they fish farther so they use more fuel for example so for that particular instance there's a technology being introduced now or an approach they call it impasse or integrated uh, multi-trophic aquaculture in which um, you have a fish cage and then different layers you have of course your fin fishes or you for example you have your bangus and then you have your seashells at the bottom which are fit uh, uh, filters uh, of, of, of the sea, for example, and then you have seaweeds. So, um, so instead of fishers going out, so you already have diverse products or commodities uh, in one area. So that, uh, and then you could, uh, there's a lot of potential for differentiation and application of those commodities. So that's, that's one aspect in terms of concrete economic benefits for the fisher, at the same time help in biodiversity and also reduce uh, greenhouse gas where they, you know, they have to go farther to get all those different um, species, for example. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amparo. So, Ms. Jerry. Yes. Um, uh, in the uh, case of um, Sarangani or Sock Surgeon region, na lang para mas malaki, um, that's where our um, processors, yung mga large companies are who are processing tuna and other um, uh, fishing uh, fish products that are being exported. So, I think, um, hindi kasi parang by literature, one of the... Uh, groups of people who are emitting the, uh, the lowest uh, amount of greenhouse gas emissions is actually the fisher coast. So, it, but then if you are going to bring their catch to industries who would process them, you have to look at what uh, 
electricity or energy resources are they using? Do they have access to more sustainable um, sources of energy? Do they have access to uh, renew renewable energy na lang siguro um, for, ano, for processing fish? Are their packaging um, environment friendly? Are they recyclable? So um, in, in terms of the fishing industry, we can look at it's not just the fishers, but also who are the other actors who can contribute to further greenhouse gas emissions or who can lessen their greenhouse gas emissions. So I think we can tap on those industries. And lastly, Ms. Nazreen. Yeah, so um, tama si uh, Ms. Uh, Francesca Tan when she mentioned about solar banka. So there are also uh, projects of climate reality leaders being implemented in Palawan already. Um, wherein they, they have this prototype of uh, solar bankas being used by uh, our farmers in Palawan. I would just like to uh, emphasize that um, our climate change uh, act, our, our plans, even our NDC, our nationally determined contribution, it spells out mitigation as a function of adaptation. The Philippines uh, emits almost negligible greenhouse gas emissions. It's very minimal compared to our developed countries. But again, it's also an opportunity for the country to uh, reduce and avoid greenhouse gas emissions. One, because uh, we bear the brunt of the effects of climate change. And of course, second, we want to be ahead of the curve in terms of the global transformation process, in terms of energy transition. So yung uh, solar-powered bankas and solar-powered um, food storage, these are mitigation uh, opportunities or projects, but kung na natin, these are adaptation uh, mechanisms for our fisher folks. And I would like to um, compliment you, sinabi ni uh, Ms. Jerry De La Santos, that to, 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 be a, to, to follow a low-carbon pathway, we also, we, we also need to see the entire supply chain of the fishing industry. Hindi lang siya sa pagkule, tapos pag nabenta na, but we also need to look at the processing, um, yung drying of, um, in the case of Sedangani, yung pag dry ng, um, ng, ng isa. I know it's it's natural, it's under uh, yung sa init ng araw, but we could further expand yung businesses of our fisher folks when we um, use te uh, technologies na um, pwedeng gamitin within the locality of Sedangani and other uh, fishing and coastal communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think Miss Jerry will la would like to plug something. Uh, yes. Um. Actually, Miss Nas Castro is our branch manager for the Climate Reality Project Philippines, and I am one of the climate reality leaders who have been trained last year. So I would like to take this opportunity. Most of the things that I know, of course, I got it from the university, from my mentors in the university, but. One of the things that I realized after my research is that there's the basabing and there's a lot of things that we need to do to raise awareness about climate change. And hindi lang to dapat na sa atin lang, hindi lang to dapat na sa academe in the um, urban areas na may access to education and internet, no? but we have to really raise awareness. And so I would like to take this opportunity to actually invite everyone to join the Climate Reality Training. <laughs> so ano to, baka ano, ano, na surprise si Miss Nas, but then this is a good opportunity because this is free. It's gonna happen on October, um, tama ba Miss Nas? It's going to be on October uh, 2021, but you can head over to their Facebook page to, um, to sign up for the climate reality training. And this is not just Filipinos who will train us. It's going to be a global set of leaders, uh, especially led by, our, uh, by the former U.S. Vice President Al Gore. Maybe Ms. Nas would like to add a little bit <laughs> detail. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Jerry, for plugging. Actually, I also want to ask for a airtime just to plug this. Um, this will be a free training with our um, founder, uh, formerly as Vice President Al Gore and other renowned uh, climate scientists. And there will be a combination of live and on-demand sessions. So you can tailor fit the uh, availability nyo on the schedule. So you have the power to really design your program, which kung, kung anong kailangan nyo. Kasi there will be different topics and um, breakout sessions 
na depende kung ano yung interest nyo and yung background nyo on climate change. So we're inviting everyone just to also brag. We're on, um, outside the United States. The Philippines um, has the top uh, registrants uh, in um, in all um, international branches. So it all, it, it's also a testament that Filipinos want to learn and want to know climate change its impact. And of course, the most important part is the solvability of climate crisis. May it be individual or um, institutional. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So for the questions that were not answered, this will be sent to our speakers and discussants. So the responses will be sent through email. Uh, please don't forget to answer the evaluation form. The link will be posted towards the end of the webinar. Uh, thank you, participants, for sending the questions and for the speakers and discussants for answering the questions comprehensively. So can I please turn you to the MC, Sir David? Yes, thank you, Ma'am Rox, for facilitating our open forum. We hope all of the questions thrown were answered thanks to our active participants and very enthusiastic set of speakers and discussants. Now, we will proceed with the overall synthesis of our knowledge sharing webinar today. Here is Ms. Mena E. O'Malley, a university researcher of the Community Innovation Study Center, SIPA, to give the overall synthesis. Hmm. Um. Thank you, David. Um, now let me share with you what I've got from our speakers and discussants. Uh, these are some of the highlights, major points, and takeaways we have learned from the two topics. Here it goes. Lakes, seas, and oceans, and other bodies of water contribute to the well-being of households in the lakeshore and coastal communities. This is usually in terms of food security, coastal economies, and even social and cultural identities. However, lakes, seas, and oceans, and any bodies of water are not spared or exempted from the so-called disturbances, whether it is natural or man-made disturbances. The occurrence of strong typhoons, which is more frequent now, as extreme heat, high temperatures, rising sea levels are some of the results of climate-related disturbances and extreme weather events mentioned by the participants in the two study sites. And it has a devastating effects on human environment and property. But because life has to go on, people, especially those who are living along the sea or the lake, have learned ways to adapt and cope with the negative effects of climate-related disturbances and extreme weather events. Adapting and coping mechanisms were done in a proactive and reactive manner, showing that these communities have awareness on what is going on with their environment. They tend to respond to these climatic changes to recover and continue living. Males and females have distinct roles in the adaptation and coping strategies they employ. As mentioned, males are usually in charge of house re reinforcement, usually structurally, and livelihood recovery. Females, on the other hand, are in charge of food and non-food preparations, house cleaning, house and um, sometimes and, and sometimes uh, assist in the livelihood activities. While households and in the coastal communities have ways to adapt and cope with these extreme weather and climate-related disturbances, there are also organizations and institutions like government, private, non-government, and even people organizations at the national and local levels that have mentioned their programs and activities about adaptation and coping strategies. Uh, usually, uh, this um, form of assistance are the provision of fishing gears and equipment, continuous education through trainings, seminars, workshop, provision of credit facilities. However, these are not localized and sometimes limited. Given all this, um, we can say that 
climate change is real. It is. Its impact has been observed and felt. Efforts have been made to address these impacts at the, at the different levels. Usually kasi, yung mga efforts na nakikita natin ay yung adaptive and coping strategies na ginagawa ng individual, ng households, at ng community. But lahat ng naandito sa mundo ay apektado. Tayong mga tao ang may consciousness about these things. So it's up to us to revisit our actions kung ito ba ay tama, kulang, or sapat na. Understanding the experiences of these households in the coastal communities can strengthen and reinforce all adaptive and coping efforts made by us and those provided by the organizations or institutions. There are programs naman and even policies. Ang kailangan lang talaga, pag-aralan pa rin kung alin ang appropriate. Mahirap talagang mag one size fits all at mag-isa-isa kasi magastos. But kung iisipin mabuti, uupuan, pag-uusapan, maybe makaka-come up ng maayos at tamang programa para sa lahat. In terms of knowledge and education, although nabanggit kanina na mababa talaga yung level of awareness ng mga households in these communities, I believe um, may mga alamang tao, uh, alam niya yung nangyayari sa kapaligiran, lalong-lalo na yung may direct na interaction dito. Nakikita at nararamdaman nila yung pagbabago. Hindi nga lang kasi nasanay ang mga tao na mag-document. So I think ang documentation ay critical para merong basis ang mga susunod na generation. With that, um, I am leaving this question to contemplate and ponder on. Uh, are we going to swim, to finish the laps, and reach the shore or coastline? Para pwede pa tayo sa susunod na race or laban? Para may chance pa tayo to do something or save and protect our lives, our environment, and future generations? Para makapagpasa pa tayo ng mga good and appropriate practices to adapt and cope? Or hayaan na lang natin na magsink tayo sa kawalan? Dahil sa nawalan tayo ng pag-asa at malasakit para maisalba ang ating sarili, pamilya, community at ang buong mundo kasama ang mga sumusunod, ang susunod na henerasyon. We have a choice. But make sure it counts. That's all and maraming salamat. Thank you very much, Ms. Lena Mali, for giving that intensive synthesis of the webinar today. At this juncture, we are now proceeding on the recognition of our distinguished speakers and discussants. For our speakers and discussants, please open your video cameras. We will now, I will now read the certificate and the citation. Next slide, please. Community Innovation Study Center of the College of Public Affairs and Development, University of the Philippines, Osbanas, presents this certificate of recognition to Maria Francesca Otan for imparting her invaluable knowledge, inspiring discussion as speaker on the topic adaptive strategies and coping mechanisms of lakeshore communities on the impacts of climate related disturbances in the major lakes of Luzon during the 2021 CISC webinar with the team Stream or Sink. Adaptation and coping strategies of coastal and lake fishing communities amidst climate change. Given this 25th of August 2021, the UPLB College Batong Malaki Los Banos Laguna. Signed, Ma'am uh, Blanquita Arpantoja, the Director of CISE, and the Dean of CIPAF, Ma'am Rowena D.T. Bacongis. Thank you very much. The same certificate of recognition presents to Ms. Samantha Geraldine G. De La Santos for imparting her invaluable knowledge and inspiring discussion as speaker on the topic adaptation when they do not know climate change. So, Langani Fisher Folk strategies through the lens of symbolic interactionism. Thank you, Paul. Now, for our discussions, certificate of appreciation to Dr. Jennifer Marie Esamparo for, sh for sharing her invaluable insights as discussion on the topic. Adaptive strategies and coping mechanisms of lake shore communities and the impacts of climate related disturbances on the major lakes of Luzon. Also, our second uh, discussion for this morning, 
to Ms. Nazrin Camille de Castro for sharing the valuable insight as discussed on the topic adaptation when we do not know climate change. So, I'm Danny Fisher, folks, strategies through the lens of symbolic interactionism. Again, thank you very much to our speakers and discussants. Kindly open your video cam for a short picture photo opportunity. Spotlight. Ready na po that team. On the count of three. One, two, three. Smile. One more po. One, two, three. Smile. Okay na po ba? Check. Okay na. Thank you very much po. Thank you. Congratulations, Paul. Now, before we proceed, thank you, ma'am, for your time and effort. So, at this moment, before we proceed to formally close our very productive webinar today, sorry, let me introduce to you the director of the Community Innovation Study Center, Director Blanquita Arpantoja, to deliver the closing remarks. Ma'am? Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, good day to everyone. As mentioned uh, by Dave earlier, CISC is one of the two research centers in CIPAF. As such, we have completed many researches, the results of which we would like to share with faculty members, researchers, students, and other project stakeholders, among others. It is for this purpose that CISC is holding a webinar series which will highlight results and implications of projects we have undertaken. While we are starting with uh, studies conducted within our center, we also intend to include later on other projects conducted by other colleagues here in CIPAF. So dun sa mga project leaders ho, sa CIPAF, watch out kasi one of these days we'll also be inviting you uh, in our webinar series. Um, the sharing of results, um, research results, was actually started by Dean Agnes Cirola here in SIPA through the annual faculty student reps conference, which was later on discontinued when the graduate school started conducting its own similar conference. But as we all know, sayang naman ang research results if it's left in one corner just to collect dust. So, uh, CISC sort of thought of um, doing this webinar para naman malaman ng mga tao ano ba ang mga pinagagagawa ng mga uh, na-research ng SIPAF. Um, to Mehmet and Sam, congratulations on your very informative presentations and thank you for agreeing to start off the CISC webinar series. I'd also like to express my gratitude to our uh, two discussants, Dr. Jen Amparo and Ms. Nas Castro for accepting our invitation. Uh, sana hindi na ito, hindi ito ang maging huling pagkakataon na may imbitahan namin kayong dalawa because uh, very definitely you were able to give us a very uh, very intensive uh, extensive insights and as well share with us your vast knowledge on the subject matter um, this webinar would have been wouldn't have been mounted uh, if not for the joint efforts of a lot of people not only in CISC but also from other units uh, I'd like to thank the knowledge management office of CIPAF which is headed by Sam for helping for helping up uh, helping CISC in drumming in drum beating this webinar. Our gratitude also goes to the Information Technology uh, Center, ITC of UPLB. Uh, the CPAF Dean's Office for always extending their support to our events and activities. And last but not the least, kudos goes to the CISC staff, particularly CROX. Uh, for her overall supervision of this activity. And of course, the rest of the staff, see Dave, our moderator, Tiny and Joanne, 
uh, who comprised the technical support team, uh, Simena, who provided the synthesis, its NG for uh, manning uh, or moderating the question and answer. And at the same time, I know may mga post uh, event activity pa silang ia address later on. And lastly, Ketita Angie, who has always been there to address the administrative needs of the technical staff. With that, um, I'd like to thank everybody for supporting um, this webinar. And we, I just hope that in our next um, uh, webinar, uh, naandito pa rin ho yung mga audience na sumuporta sa amin. Thank you and good day. Again, good day to everyone. Thank you very much, Director Bland, for your message. Again, thank you to all hardworking men and women of CISC pa. Indeed, we hope that our participants have learned valuable knowledge and information about climate change realities and what we can do to save our future. For participants who will be requesting an e-certificate of attendance, it is now shown on your screen. Please that there is the link and the QR code that will lead you to the evaluation form. The copy of the presentation slides, if you want to request to have a copy, it is also embedded in the questions in the evaluation form. And for others who want to rewatch this webinar, this is recorded, so just go to the official Facebook page of UPLB College of Public Affairs and Development. I think that's a wrap. We thank all of you for joining us in this webinar organized by the Community Innovation Study Center, CIPAC, UPLB, and stay tuned in our upcoming webinars. Once again, I am David Rodriguez, your moderator for today. Thank you very much, and please continue to be safe. Thank you. Po.